you know, there's a, cho a choosing happening, and in this sense, an unconscious production of that choosing. I think that's fair. So I agree with you. Reich is indispensable, and I'm glad you are familiar with him because I actually don't know his work very well. Well, I, I wasn't, but I, I, and I'll get into it. I downloaded and read the Mass Psychology of Fascism. I think it's called. Uh, this is the full name. It sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, ah, uh, it's great, and absolutely one of the one of the scarier things I've ever read because it was written, like, pre what we knew Hitler was going to be. Like parts of it are from like. 2233 before what we know as Hitler becomes Hitler. So there's a really, it's not cool to read given how he talks about it and how, you know, things that are happening maybe in our world a little bit have a really terrifying similarity. Um, so, uh, about Reich, actually, uh, I had this question. Uh, I was just rereading uh, the section in chapter two on social repression and they say uh reich uh was the true founder of a materialist psychiatry but i thought i remembered somewhere in chapter one them saying that like reich would either like view things materially or like historically and he wouldn't like go far enough to be considered the founder of a materialist psychiatry or am i misremembering that so you're not you're not wrong um but it's it's there's a twist on it, and we'll get into that because I think we're going to try to have a semblance of uh, kind of order to this. I want to get to Reich, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off because um, I think we got a bunch of people in here, and uh, we're obviously already really chomping at the bit to get going on this. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I have to give my little uh, intro speech as I always do. So apologies to everyone who has to listen to this so many times, but uh, thank all of you for joining us. Uh, today on the Quarantine Collective's uh, ongoing reading, rereading, and remembering of Anti-Oedipus. Uh, today we are going to be doing a large roundtable on the concept of social repression. We had a, we put out a call, I started getting notes from people, hey, what about this, questions after the last few we've had, and uh, when Ben, uh, who, as you just heard talking, uh, was like, we should just do social repression, it was like, yeah, that's kind of the central next big point I think we're going to dive into. Um, real quick for announcements, uh, this week, please take a look at the literature poll. It is up. Work has not been chosen. Uh, if you are not part of the literature group or, or has a work been chosen, Jack? Oh, work has been, I just haven't announced it yet. Cause I usually post it right after this, but yeah, it's Bataille's the solar anus. Of course it overwhelming is. Overwhelming majority. Of course it is. God damn it. We're never going to get to, uh, I want to get to flair T. O'Connor so badly. Um, we're not ever going Around to. there for four months. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm the only person I think who's voted for it. But, um, and sorry, Ben. It's not, I don't say it's because you didn't understand part of chapter two. What? I'm so confused, Ben. What are you saying? No, I'm saying like, I, like, the reason I suggested it is definitely not because <laughs> I didn't understand it. Right, like sarcastic. Uh, uh, understood. Uh, fair enough. So, um, the setup is going to be really simple today. Um, I want Ken, uh, because I think it's important for us to have a little bit of a foundational discussion just so we understand where DNG and Anti Oedipus are coming into it, how they fit into sort of the tradition of psychoanalysis. Uh, if you have a second, Ken, would you like to uh, jump up and talk a little bit about social and psychic repression uh, from a psychoanalytic point of view? Yeah, I can try, and it'll just take me a couple minutes. Um, so repression. Uh, first, I guess, important thing is that repression is always the return of the repressed. And it's not like amnesia, or it's not like... It's not like I'm foregoing a certain satisfaction or something like that. Um, So repression is always the return of the repressed. So what is returning? What is returning is what is called the primordially repressed. And this is supposed to be like the nucleus of the whole complex. Um, but what is the primordially repressed? The primordially rep repressed 
is a lack of a binary signifier that could formalize a coherent meaning. It's the lack of the binary signifier, a binary relationship between signifier and signified. Um, uh, and this binary relationship, uh, so what psychoanalysis is trying to do in talking about repression is that they're trying to formalize the impasses of formalization they believe itself. Um, and this would be language. Um, so what is returning from the repressed is, in some strange way, sexuality, being this lack of a sexual relationship, this lack of a binary signifier. Um, but it is as at once a lack and an excess. So you've got a negative one, and then you've got this excess enjoyment that comes from it. And this excess enjoyment provides an equivocity to any sort of attempt at formalization. I'm almost done. Um, and so what is returning in the repressed is this impasse and what they believe uh, is the impasse of formalization itself, which can be found in sexuality or any other sort of paradox or contradiction. Um, and what's not report returning, it's not like uh, I'm being repressed by the state so much or repressed by my parents or something like that. Um, what's what's oppressive is the uh, the ability that you can't say at all. That at most you can speak a half truth because there is a material limit of language. And this is what's returning whenever there is the return of the repressed. All right. That that relates to differentiation, yeah. Uh, how? Oh, um, you said there's like a problem with something like, it sounded like the last part, um, you were saying there's like this thing that, um, you can only partially articulate. Mm -hmm. Is that because, um, it's only partial because there's a problem of differentiation in the psychological sense? Uh, you know, if you call the materiality of language psychological, then I guess yes. Um, but that's not necessarily the sense that I get from reading all this stuff. The sense that I get is that there is a, so there is no meta language. Language is already a meta language. And this is another way to say that there is no other of the other. The real does not hold a truth. The real is the, is the being, is the not without having a truth, is that in saying I am lying, I could also be saying, I am not lying, and um, and vice versa, and also all sorts of other variations of that. It's not so much psychological for psychoanalysis, is the is what I get. It's more this uh, this problem of articulation and formalization itself. And whenever you have a slip of the tongue, or whenever you have some sort of bungled action. What is happening is this return of the real is the impasse of formalizing something itself. Thank you. you could, could you repeat the last bit of that again, Ken? Uh, maybe. Um, I, got a, I got a quote from Zupanchich that can probably say this better than I can, if that's what you want to hear. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, okay, um, this is what Lacanian mathemes are all about. A matheme is not simply a formalization of some reality. Rather, as Lacan himself puts it, it is the formalization of the impasse of formalization. What is thus crucially important important to the point uh, to point out is that for Lacan it is not simply formalization as such that is interesting. What is interesting are the impasses, paradoxes it produces as points of its own impossibility, which can themselves be in quotes formalized. 
And this is precisely why logic was so important to Lacan. Um, so, so whenever you like uh, say, you know, fuck instead of luck or something like this, and then you know the idea is that this would be the return of the oppressed, and I think the the sort of uh, meager interpretation of this psychoanalytic notion is that what you were oppressing was you know your sexual wants like your genital sexual wants psychoanalysis is not primarily the drives are not genital drives the drives are pre-genital so it doesn't have anything to do with you know uh uh permutations of penis and vagina and stuff like that it has to do with this problem of sexuality being this limit of formalization as such and so whenever you say fuck instead of luck, it's not that you want to fuck. It's that um, in, lang in language itself is provided this opportunity for equivocity, for multiple uh, uh, signifieds to be attached to a signifier, that there is no binary relationship. So fuck can mean sex, fuck can mean like a pejorative term, fuck can mean all these other things. And that's what they're pointing at. Well, so I, I want to take a, a step back because that's that's great, Kent. I, I want to kind of talk through this because we have a lot of people here who haven't made their way all the way through AO and probably don't have a background through uh, a few other things. The re repression itself, and let me try to say it a different way, Kent. The way that Freud talks about repression and kind of, I don't want to say invented it, although I think Deleuze and Guattari would probably say something along those lines. Uh, the, the idea originally around repression is that uh, we have uh, uh, these unbridled, awful desires that are primal, primordial inside of us as animalistic creatures. We want to fuck our mom. We want all these things. We want all of this stuff. And over time, we learn to repress, to, to place these things beneath the requirements of a social interaction, beneath the requirements of socialization. And that a healthy person... Uh, who handles this and does this correctly is ultimately what we want in society. And those who are uh, unhealthy, it is because they have uh, either not repressed properly or uh, allowed these desires to break out. And so the nature of a lot of Freud's work very much pushes this idea that repression is a uh, necessity and a goal and that we are to build up a lot of methods to allow people to be properly repressed effectively by uh, identity, identifying ourselves with, uh, in the Oedipus complex case, uh, identifying properly with the mother-father triangulation uh, and putting ourselves in a place that we are allowed to be part of the larger social context in a way that is healthy and, and good. Uh, I think that's the that's how I've always understood, uh, even with Lacanian, it's a slightly different tactic on it, but I don't think it's drastically different uh, than that, Ken. Am I off? Uh, Lacan sees himself as the rightful reader of Freud, so I don't think he would think it was drastically different. Yeah, that's... Uh, and so I think where, where, where we get to Deleuze in a lot of this is... Um, they, they came upon, there's another uh, writer that's important to bring in, and that's uh, someone I mentioned a bit earlier is Wilhelm Reich. Uh, Wilhelm Reich did uh, a ton of different uh, studies and writing and all kinds of different things, but um, I want to float back to uh, the line that they use inside of anti Oedipus and then discuss a little bit about Reich's work. Uh, one of the things that they talk about when they talk about repression in anti Oedipus is... Uh, you know, as they go through the, the, the syntheses, the paralogisms, the ways we interact, the way our, our desires are created, they ultimately get to the point that I think is their fulcrum, which is uh, the discussion around uh, why people desire their own oppression. Uh, the quote specifically they, they pull from Wilhelm Reich is that the astonishing thing is not that some people steal and that others occasionally go out on strike, but rather that all of those who are starving do not simply steal as regular practice, and all those who are exploited are not continually out on strike. After centuries of exploitation, why do people still tolerate being humiliated and enslaved? To such a point, indeed, that they actually want humiliation and slavery, not only for others, but for themselves. This is them looking at repression in a very different way, uh, where they 
begin to sort of play into the larger concepts that they pull into anti-Oedipus about how uh, these ideas, for example, Oedipus, which we'll get into, uh, that repression actually creates its own repression. Uh, that the, the modern invention of repression and the way that we sort of handle that as its own signifier, idea, symbol, how, however you want to phrase it, is actually the cause of repression itself, uh, which is one of the things I, I really love about uh, when we start talking about this. So there's, there's a couple steps to this. Um, first, any, any comments, any, anyone who want to bend what I, want to, what I said off in a different direction? Just, just real fast, I think a great example of this concept of repression being the cause of repression is seen in like sort of the way the I don't know how to say this right the the like war that ends up being waged on mothers in response to like psychoanalytic things. So you get like the refrigerator mother or the schizophrenogenic mother and stuff like this. Yeah, and this is one of their big moves, and this is one of the reasons I think Reich and um, even Marcuse are so important here is, at least classically, as I understand it, a major part of psychic repression um, didn't exactly incorporate the social context the way that um, these other thinkers are going to. Right, so the mother was, I think the totality of the social context was something like the familial, but it was its deeply personal, right? Um, what was going on there it was very individual. Whereas what these thinkers are doing is they're opening up um, the group, right? They're opening up something like a social repression or a psychic repression relative to a collective, which isn't even just people for Deleuze and Guadri, right? That's one of their big moves. Um, but it's a collectivity. Uh, with that too, we even see like group fantasies in that, like, you're always connected with other people and with other objects here. So that seems to be one of the major moves um, in that, that development of thought here. For sure. And I think the, the line that they use from Reich about why do people who are starving not simply steal as a matter of, of practice, and Reich goes on a little bit, and his entire commentary is about how there is no animal on earth who, if it was starving, would not simply take the food that was in front of it, and yet how somehow man will do that uh, almost to the point where they're, they literally will just die. And it's a really interesting part of the reality of being human. Uh, so, so why? Like that's that's their big question: is why the why is this happening? Why why have we gotten to this point? And for them, as we've talked about, they've they've built up a lot of text before we've gotten to this point about how our desires are not necessarily something that are uh, you know from some random place uh, that sort of pop around that we don't simply have these full object, fully idealized ideas of desire. The idea uh, in their machinic unconscious that uh, you have a primordial desire to fuck your mom isn't possible because you simply don't, not only does your desire machines not really have a concept of what fucking is, but they also have no idea who your mom is. That's not really how they work. They work on partial objects. They work on little bits. Uh, so as the sort of process begins to develop, they start looking at how these grander social plays and social concepts actually in themselves create the thing that uh, they are forbidding. And Oedipus is one of their big first pushes uh, towards this. And I think it's probably the best way for us to be able to talk about the apparatus of how this works, because obviously it's the entire book, but it'll give us a chance, I think, to talk through uh, how we get to the paranoiac uh, and how we get to the schizophrenic, how we get to the neurotic, how we get to all of these different uh, you know, bends of how repression and anti-production produce different aspects of the human psyche. Uh, so I'd love to sort of dive in a little bit there, uh, unless anyone has a different direction they want to take. I think that's probably the most useful for us. Yeah, I like it. And, and to help us with that and, and getting into the mechanisms, right? Part of what happens, as I understand, the psychic repression is, um, a, is is the problem of how to release the tension in the unconscious, 
right? Which is what Brooks was talking about in terms of like the social acceptability, right? There's a presence of superego in that model, right? Where the tension in the unconscious should be released in a certain acceptable way, or otherwise the tension is kind of, um, in this model is displaced in that manner, right? It has that kind of repression because it can't be right. released. Right, right. What we see um, developing out of this are like techniques of sublimation and transference, which we're going to see Deleuze and Guattari um, engage very differently here. Yes. So uh, let's take a step back and talk about uh, Oedipus as a formation and the reason that they attack it directly, specifically. Um, so the Oedipal complex, uh, the background of it is pretty simple. We're all fairly familiar. Uh, Freudian idea uh, that uh, at the primordial level, uh, we actually want to kill our fathers and uh, have sex with our mothers. We, She's the first uh, woman we love and want, and so therefore we want to fuck her. Our dad is the rival for that. How do we handle that? Uh, ultimately, Freud's way is through managing our repression so that way we have a healthy relationship with our mother we handle our father and uh, we can kind of accept him and then we do the same thing by finding our own displaced version of our mom in a new wife and then we do the same thing to our son and we as our son is growing uh, we impart upon him all of the issues with oedipus as well this is what freud considers to be healthy the extrapolation of this is that everything in our lives actually can be sort of ascribed to our unhealthy or healthy relationships with our mother or father. You have an issue with the authority. Oh, well, that's because you never really truly accepted your father. You have uh, problems with uh, women or you have this or that. Well, it's because you really never accepted the fact that you couldn't fuck your mom. Uh, this is what we need from you. You need to learn to repress properly. And uh, with Deleuze and Guattari, they, they take a step back and they say uh, they they take a step back and they go, well, wait a second. The, the nature of the Oedipus complex, if we are talking about the way that desire is formed and the way that this repression happens in the moment that I get told that Oedipus exists uh, again, I've been growing my whole life. My desire machines have been firing off at some point. I get told uh, that the world operates as it does. I have a father who acts as though he is the father in the Oedipal Triangle and I'm the child. I have a mother who does the same. They're ultimately trying to Oedipalize me. And my, my prohibition when I'm told, well, you can't fuck your mom. It, the difficulty with that is that it didn't come from the pre-self. It's actually an idea that existed almost as an idea first. Uh, we talked about this a little bit during the paralogisms talk. I think that was last week. A lot of this is blending together. Uh, the, the nature of the paralogisms and how they fire off is uh, they actually cause our desire because of the fact that these things fire off after the fact and the idea is coming to us uh, during the process of the three syntheses. Uh, the signs that it imparts and the relations it forces between signs actually cause us to displace our desire, which is a very unique sort of setup. And I'd love to talk through that if anyone has anything to say. Or did I go too far? <laughs> I have a question. If there's, if there's um, uh, a perceived difference between something that is, let's say, an idea imposed or some kind of story uh, told after the, the, the process is going on and things that they consider more real, although still maybe being global objects. I'm sorry, what is the question? Are you asking the difference between uh, what they would call, uh, well, in this case, let's say Oedipus uh, as a thing versus uh, Oedipus as a complex that is repressive versus the, the reality of Oedipus, which does exist. There are people who have really unhealthy relationships with their mother and father that they do desire their mother sexually. And it's a, actually a, a thing. And as they talk about in here, that Oedipus exists like this. It's not saying Oedipus doesn't exist. Their qualm with the entire process is that Oedipus actually exists primordially that it exists pre-subject, that it is a sort of natural state of people. And they're saying is there is no natural state of people. That's essentially their big sort of step, as I understand it. 
Yeah, so my question there is actually, <clears throat> do they do they believe in any, let's let's say, sort of permanent state of anything? Or is it literally all um, uh, an ongoing process? I mean, this is a philosophy of change and difference, right? So the three syntheses are, you know, it's fairly consistent, but the way they're what they're producing and everything is changing right and the three syntheses there are paralogistic uses of them right so even they don't have a right so it's not a platonic thing where these things are immutable um there's there's paralogisms of the uh, of even that yeah so i would say um the, to them, it is a philosophy of change and of becoming. And so the only thing that they would say that is pretty consistent is the, the idea of becoming. Uh, this idea that there is a primordial nature to almost any of our desires, I would say, maybe overall any, except for desire itself, uh, I think they would uh, be pretty against conceptually. And a lot of it can be, again, when we go through this and we start talking about how to identify social repression, how it links to psychic repression, and then how psychic repression connects to the syntheses and paralogisms. This process is essentially what chapter four is about, is being able to break this down and talk through these steps. So that way you can start identifying these things perhaps not in your own life, but th that you can do it in uh, the way society's functioning, what's happening in the world, schizoanalysis as a concept. So you're kind of describing a little bit of the breakdown of uh, the, the how schizoanalysis might work, uh, which we'll get to at some point, uh, probably next week, actually. To, to build on answering your question, Nish, um, yeah, so there are ontological aspects of this that do show up, right? We have flows, we have machines, we have desiring production now. We have codes and codes change and decoding and recoding processes. So there's always um, processes at work, right? Even with the syntheses, right? They, uh, one of the things the first synthesis does is it allows for changes in assemblages, right? The breast can um, leave one context and be reconfigured in another. So things are constantly changing in that manner. I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah, for sure. And I just have a follow-up thought, and maybe it's a bit off-topic, so please respond to it shortly if it's off-topic. But how they would relate, for example, to um, other fields of science like biology and neuro neuropsychology. Um, because I know that philosophy is often used to frame these other sciences uh, to then produce very different results. And is there like a Deleuzian framework for something like neuropsychology? Um, I would recommend checking out uh, Delanda's work. He actually tries to use Deleuze's philosophy and, and help understand it in terms of science and that. But yeah, I, I would say there's not necessarily a conflict, right? It's a question of the metaphysics that you're going to work with um, in terms of something like biology. It's so like if you were going to do like biodeterminism, uh, Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's work would probably not be the metaphysics you want for that. <laughs> Uh, I'll I'll do Lou's job since he isn't here. Uh, Bergson has a lot to say about biology, and I think uh, it's not far from where Deleuze's position would be, uh, especially kind of his work on creative evolution versus where uh, Deleuze kind of gets into an ATP, the ideas of like external milieus and stuff. Uh, I think there's a lot of crossover with Bergson. Thursdays at noon. It is worth also getting into, I'm going to start bringing up, uh, uh Marco, uh, mentions that it's worth talking a little bit about the paranoiac machine as they talk about it. And I believe uh, 1-1.2, uh, when they start getting into the body without organs and how it functions within the desiring machines, uh, the, the way that they 
uh, see the paranoia functioning in this. Again, is is not necessarily, uh, as they say, it is not a counter cathexis, uh, primary repression, uh, but rather this repulsion of desiring machines by the body without organs. The, the nature of desiring machines and how they function when they're near, let's say, dealing with the body without organs. The body without organs repels desiring machines very much by its nature. Desiring machines want to connect to it because it has the things that have happened before. It's got the organization. It's got all these really, really sexy sort of desirable things for desiring machines. Obviously, they can't connect. And so it's constantly sort of putting them down, shoving them back, making them connect to new things. It's the nature of, again, the BWO is to uh, break our fixations. Uh, as they talk about it, the animalistic side of our desiring machines is if we could, we would connect to a thing that is, uh, you know, there and never let go. A uh, baby would never let go of the mother's breast and would drink itself uh, to death. Uh, the, the impulse and control is not so much there. The body without organs exists as you know, helping that disconnection happen, making that happen, and giving us new things to constantly connect to. So the, the paranoiac and the, the, the paranoia here then uh, has to do with the fear of things uh, becoming unraveled, uh, breaking down, coming apart, the, the nature of the disconnections being terrifying. And uh, the paranoiac, uh, to quote uh, Emma Downs, one of my favorite writers on Medium, the paranoid subject is the one that fears its own undoing and dismantlement. The, the nature of the paranoiac machine is produced in the tension between desiring machines and the body without organs. Uh, the paranoiac machine is produced uh, with this tension, and it is a desiring machine in a state of breaking down. That is modification or an avatar of a very specific desiring machine. Uh, this production becomes a mental operation. Has no bearing here, though. Uh, Judge Schreber was diagnosed as paranoiac by Freud. For Lacan, paranoid, paranoia is a kind of schizophrenia or psychosis. Uh, for Freud, Voigt viewed paranoia as a defense against homosexual desire. Uh, Lacan rejected this and uh, made it closer to foreclosure. Um, uh, they then uh, make a lot of references to a, an idea of a person's own body uh, being the projection for the paranoiac. And they simply don't agree. The genesis of the machine lies precisely here in opposition of the process of production of desiring machines and non-productive stasis of the body without organs. This is where the paranoiac machine comes into play is that moment. <clears throat> and that paranoiac machine, again, the attention uh, to the fear of unraveling, the, the, the way that it works, the, the willingness to attach to things when an idea comes from outside that allows anti-production to start pushing, that allows the uh, the displacement. What is the term that they use, Jack, for the paralogism? I'm not displacement. Is, I don't think the right one. Am I wrong? Uh, the, the fourth paralogism would be displacement, yes. And um, also they use disfiguration uh, earlier in the chapter along with displacement. Oh, I like disfiguration. I think we'll want to be careful there too, though, just to point out that what, what the, the paranoiac machine that's created, um, at least in this sense where we're talking about the first and second synthesis, right? That's created through the body without organs, um, pushing a flow to those machines to create that avatar. But that does work with production, right? Um, they give the example of Judge Schraber's organs miraculating to um, regenerate and start producing, right? So you got your schizophrenic machines there, but this happens in relation to the paranoiac machine of God who, um, who works in relation to this production to try and get them to stop working in that way. So connections and disconnections disconnection, for sure, but this, this, uh, this play between the two, the way they work on one another that's very important. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a thing real quick if someone wants to uh, uh, dive in. Yeah. Let me expand on that because we, we've talked about the return of the repressed. 
So this is where I think you're going to start to see differences in, in repression as they're understanding it, right? Um, primarily so, like, they talk about the return of the repressed as a point to introduce the celibate machine. So we're already seeing how there's a lot of um, change happening here. One of the main things I think is worth keeping in mind about anti-Oedipus is that it's it's not a destruction of psychoanalysis, it's a re-engagement with it and a changing of it in a lot of ways, right? Schizoanalysis comes out of psychoanalysis and arguably not with an Oedipal relationship, which we'll get into later. But um, in this sense, the celibate machine is that which is going to produce um, subjectivity. Yeah. You, you can start to see one of the important points they're making here is that the return of the repressed isn't going to be um, something repressed trying to trying to play out in you, right? This is going to be more so um, collective subjectivity, right? The celibate machine distributing these subjectivities and us kind of saying, oh, so that's what it was, right? But I, I want to stress this because here, this isn't the kind of repression that is um, is necessarily mitigated by a superego, right? This is occurring through the body without organs and these syntheses producing, right, in the process of production. Uh, later, a little bit in the chapter, uh, chapter two, there's a line... Uh, but they kind of, I can't find it now, but they say like uh, psychic repression is a means in the service of social repression and that it bears on desiring production and basically uh, makes desiring production desire social repression. But what's the, what's the mechanism, I guess, in psychic repression that causes desire to desire social repression. Is that a super broad question? Um, a little bit, but I think we can tackle that. So you're absolutely right. They understand social, and this is really important because like psychoanalysis in a sense does discover Oedipus, right? Um, they make the point during chapter two, uh, section eight, I think it is, that people came to Freud wanting more Oedipalization, right? This is this is actually a really big move for them because like even in the interpretation of dreams, Freud talks about discovering Oedipus, right, as something that's present. Now he's going to say it's primordial and we can, we can talk about that elsewhere, but the point is to, to recognize that people actually were experiencing this kind of social repression um, prior to Freud and the the understanding of universal history they lay out in chapter three really takes you how to uh, in, into how they believe Oedipus and how they argue Oedipus is created, what the conditions are for the creation of Oedipus, how that can even be possible, right? So that's one element of it. Um, I would say the simple answer to what you're talking about and your question is probably going to be the fifth paralogism, where they talk about, um, and I can pull up uh, the quotes, but uh, where they talk about kind of like the the way Oedipus is taken as a sort of given, and things are constructed um, around it, right? And so in this way, psychic repression can become a really good agent of uh, social repression in that sense, right? Because this mechanism, these metaphysics, right? This is all built around Oedipus and can be uh, mobilized in that sense. And again, this doesn't necessarily happen at an origin point of Freud, right? That's really critical here because by the time Freud comes on the scene, it's arguably already there, right? We get new mechanisms. And I, I think it's important to distinguish uh, where the line in regimes is for them when they talk about social versus psychic repression. Uh, because they get into this uh, quite a bit when they start talking specifically in uh, chapters three and four about how uh, Oedipus functions uh, as psychic repression, not social. Uh, 
it's a it's a very important sort of distinction. So for them, they see uh, social repression as essentially being that which is repressed sort of by the socius, the larger social category, the regime of the molar, uh, the larger social machines. Well, psychic repression, well, uh, we may identify it with us. They 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 definitely uh, talk about it in the sense of uh, uh, familial. Uh, those were directly around the the people who sort of. Uh, uh, influence our life directly, create our uh, our body without organs, our responses, our our all of that. Um, the 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 difference is, I think, significant because as we start getting into this, and we start talking about why, for example, uh, Oedipus uh, works as a social construct or a social repression. It's not so much that it does; it's that uh, the social and socius and repression that's happening at that level. Uh, which is a, in our place capitalism uh, specifically is encouraged, built up the hierarchies that are created inside of psychic repression that is created by uh, Oedipus and by the repression there that the desires it targets and how it sets it up, the, the hierarchy it, it informs is ultimately what really does encourage a, a great deal of uh, the overall social repression and the structure that enables that as well. They're hand in hand. One is an extension of the other. Yeah, that's that's spot on. They have to go hand in hand because the, the point is that they work in relation to one another. And right, we're talking about the unconscious through um, autopoiesis, through its, its production of itself. So the way Oedipus actually works in relation to that self-production is important there. Um, and I, I promise some quotes. So this is page 119. Psychic repression distinguishes itself from social repression by the unconscious nature of the operation and by its result. Quote, even the inhibition of revolt has become unconscious, end quote. A distinction that expresses clearly the difference in nature between the two repressions. But a real independence cannot be concluded from this. Psychic repression is such that social repression becomes desired. Let me read that again. Psychic repression is such that social repression becomes desired. It induces a consequent desire, a faked image of its object, on which it bestows the appearance of independence. Strictly speaking, psychic repression is a means in the service of social repression. What it bears on is also the object of social repression, desiring production. But it is in fact, I'm sorry, but it in fact implies an original double operation. The repressive social formation delegates its power to an agent, an agent of psychic repression. And correlatively, the repressed desire is as though masked by the faked, displaced image to which the repression gives rise. Psychic repression is delegated by the social formation, while the desiring formation is disfigured, displaced, by psychic repression. The family is the delegated agent of psychic repression, or rather, the agent delegated to psychic repression. The incestuous drives are the disfigured image of the repressed. The Oedipus complex, the process of Oedipalization, is therefore the result of this double operation. So we're talking about a larger social repression that exists, and we'll talk about capitalism just in general. We can talk about fascism. They're all kind of the same uh, thing uh, in, in this kind of context. Uh, these, these larger social categories require uh, desiring agents and desiring machines to be inscribed in very particular order. The socialist doesn't necessarily directly act on uh, desiring machines. That's not how it, it operates. Instead, it would need an agent on its surface, as they talk about. Uh, it would need an agent that does. And uh, the line that they have is, uh, social production would need at its disposal on the recording surface of the socius, an agent that is also capable of acting on, of inscribing the recording surface of desire. Such an agent exists, the family. Uh, this idea of the social body as this collective matrix uh, of all of these things, um, recordable medium of desire upon which agents can act on and inscribe laws or norms or repression. But we're talking about how those things ultimately create apparatuses that within, say, the family or within the direct uh, creation of our own BWO have that large scale of influence.
Uh, so that's uh, just the, the difference between the two, because uh, again, uh, Oedipus is not the, the larger social repression that we're talking about. Oedipus is the agent that causes our personal, you know, like you know, the subjects, let, let me just say mine. I know it's decentered and all that, but you know, my repression is caused by Oedipus because at large, this is just how I was raised, the world I'm grown in, all of these things. This is how people are to behave and how I've been told I need to triangulate myself in order to be a healthy, good member of society. And over time, uh, this doesn't work out and things pop out. But what it does in the meantime is it allows me to accept the authority of the father or my manager or my CEO or my president. Uh, this, this kind of repression is how it plays out in those system between the two works. But I want to come in here because this is where we have to understand the, um, the Oedipus complex and the Oedipal relationship, right? So there is a way of talking about um, Oedipus in terms of father and mother, right? In the very familial sense, um, which we've kind of covered. But there's also the aspect of the Oedipus relation, the Oedipal relationship, which I think is part of what this book is trying to take on because the Oedipal relationship carries with it a really interesting response to the problem of how do you change things um, and of like things like power relationships, right? So with the Oedipal relationship, you have something, so I'm going to draw on civilization's discontents for this, right? So if you're caught up with your father who enables you to have a certain life, right? But there's also a, a take with that, right? To, to have a certain life in relation to your father, you have to give up certain things, right? There's a tension here. Um, with that, something like the mother appears as, um, and I've always taken it as something like the means of creativity, right? So if, if one were to supersede their father, they would have um, this relationship with their, their mother in a sense that they're able to start creating things the way they want to, as opposed to... Um, having to mitigate it in relation to the father. I think that's a general way of understanding the triangle. Now, if we walk this out to institutions, right, institutions sort of take the place of the father. In this sense, power relations, so it's not even just the CEO, right? It, it's very directly how you fit into the social context and that, how you fit into things like the manager and, and other managers, right? You end up having multiple fathers in a rather Mormon-like way or I guess a reverse Mormon way. But this is one thing we'll get into as we talk about social repression here, is how the Oedipal relationship, um, as, a, as a way of understanding the problem of power relations, of understanding social contexts, and of actually like arguably taking us out of a way of dealing with these kind of social problems because the social repression displaces it onto Oedipus and constructs out of that um, a sort of a simultaneous um, thing, right? The Oedipal relationship as a displacement. So I want to try to explore that a little bit more. Um, I I have a I guess my question is uh, exactly what uh, is D and G's response to Freud, and uh, it seems what I'm so what I'm gathering is. They're saying, they seem to be saying, uh, there are these syntheses that Freud never really talks about. And in a way, there are kind of, I think somebody mentioned metaphysics in the, um, uh, in the chat. And uh, I guess the syntheses are supposed to be a kind of transcendental condition, maybe, for, you know, the kind of thing that Freud is talking about. So... In a way, they're not saying like Oedipus doesn't ever happen or there is no such thing as Oedipus. It's all an invention. You know, it seems like they would say, yeah, sure, it's a phenomenon. Like you, we can identify it. It happens. But there are all these preconditions. Like it's not the most basic thing. There's something deeper and it's these syntheses. And somehow they can help us explain how Oedipus happens. Like is that is that on the right track? Yes, it's on the right track. So with the syntheses, they're talking about how the unconscious produces itself, right? Autopoiesis. And the mutual um, reciprocal um, contingencies that go into that. So 
to get your question right, Oedipus is not primordial. Oedipus happened over a long period of time, right? Um, Because they're going to talk about in chapter three how Oedipus, um, basically what what happens and what gets built up over a long period of time to make Oedipus even possible, right? So that when Freud started practicing his um, his clinic in that, people were already coming Oedipalized. They give the example of Igor Stravinsky talking about his relationship with his parents and actually a, a great example of sublimation where his, his music was a way of dealing with um, familial problems. So yes, Oedipus is contingent. Well, I, let me, and, I can actually, I'm going to give a very short version of this because I've done this before and I really like this explanation. Someone else said, uh, the way to think of Oedipus is not that it's primordial, but that it was created contingently over time through a series of interactions on large social scales. If you go back 300 years, 200 years, the idea of uh, what we consider to be the nuclear family being the norm is laughable on its face to the vast majority of people. That The idea that a, one couple, a man and a woman, would have two children or three, and that would be it, would be the outlier beyond words. Over time, as uh, the industrial situation and the, the setup changed, the, the idea of what a family meant to society shifted. And this is the nature of how the socialists operate uh, is they operate a bit like uh, similar ways to the BWO. They are the sens de la vie of the society we're in, how, how desire is produced, how subjects are produced, how things you know exist in relation to each other. And so how a family and parents and people relate to each other over time, especially you know right before Freud, the last 20 years, 30 years prior, uh, because of industrialization and all this, the family became a thing. And it became a thing as Reich talks about it in Germany, for example, in the 20s. The shift was fascinating, but it was not all true. It was uh, because Germany, for example, uh, wanted this ideal, idealized um, uh, family that's the farm family, the, the couple who raises their kids and they raise them to be strong, not the industrial workers, those people are dirty, and not the super wealthy, they're too bougie. We have this very particular idea of what a family is supposed to be, and that very much informed Freud as he started looking at, well, look, our society is so healthy. Uh, I mean, this obviously didn't turn out to be the case, but he's like, oh, this is so great. Look at how good these people are getting. It must be because they have a healthy family relationship. And that's what we've learned because we are so wonderful now and we are so not savages anymore and we don't live under despotism. This is what free people will live like this. Oh, you have problems? You must not understand how to live within the family. And that that change happened over time. But Freud very much took it as, oh, no, this has been the problem is people haven't been able to have healthy relationships with their parents. Now they're able to. And I can tell you how. And uh, they do it from the point of starting with the signifier. Like I, that's what it's done is they start with that that thing, the Oedipus complex, and they work backwards. Deleuze and Guattari's response is that this is not only completely contingent on the family, but uh, it it places a lot of assumptions because of how our semiotics work inside of our minds, how desiring machines produce signs, how we find relations between objects and things. And so what you're doing is by saying everything needs to be mommy, daddy, me, uh, you're actually by univocalizing these, this wonderful tapestry of all of the experiences we've had and saying that every experience, and this is very Freudian, every experience is either mommy or daddy everything's related to this triangle and anything that doesn't fit that is not good and I need to figure out how it fits and they will spend hours and hours and hours and hours telling you how it fits and then at some point your job is to go yes that makes sense I am oedipalized now I am so healthy <laughs> um, that's the very short version of that it's a it's a fascinating sort of discourse but it's yeah for sure sorry Jack I didn't mean to interrupt yeah, so that's really helpful. Uh, can I uh, dig a little bit deeper? Uh, of course. I'm just so I'm so I'm thinking about um, uh, the story that Freud tells in Civilization and Discontents, uh, and I'll try to I'll just summarize it very briefly. And I'm really curious, you know, how can we sort of uh, bring the syntheses to play uh, in in play in relation to what he says there? In a way to kind of uh, show that that de that depth 
that D and G are, are are looking for. Um, so just very briefly, um, the what I remember from from Freud is, uh, you know, he says there is this force of necessity. You know, we can't all just have sex and eat and uh, you know have fun all the time. There is necessity and that gets imposed on us in various ways and primarily through the parents and the family or teachers and so on. And basically what happens is we end up internalizing that, right? And that's how the superego gets formed. And he gives the story of how, you know, if my father tells me no uh, to some desire, I feel anger and aggression towards him, but then I introject that and I kind of direct that aggression towards myself. And that becomes my superego, and that becomes the world. Oh, uh, I think you cut out there, buddy. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, so basically, he uses this metaphor of, it's like society sets up a garrison inside the psyche, like an outpost. Uh, but basically, it's, you know, our own aggression that, you know, I would want to, you know, hurt my father and fight him, but I obviously can't do that. So I kind of direct that inward towards myself. And that becomes the repressive superego. And I guess what I'm, uh, my sense is D and G are saying, uh, sure, that's a, that's a phenomenon, right? That, that's empirically, it happens. But there's a whole, uh, you know, a whole, like there are layers and layers of like, workings like machines and you know the sort of the um somebody uh, called it the autopoiesis of the unconscious that freud never talks about and i'm really curious like how does that come into this picture because i kind of have this disconnect between you know here's the story that freud tells here's what dng talk about and there's like this huge gap in between and I'm not really sure how to fill that. So that's that's what I'm asking. I hope this isn't too like uh, all over the place. Oh, that's, that's actually great. And that's where I'm trying to, when I'm talking about um, the adipo relationship and that, that's where I'm I'm trying to look at it in, in terms of that question. Um, because I think that's the a big part of the states, especially with social repression, right? So there's a level where we can talk about like the mommy, daddy, me thing. But um, that, at least as I understand Deleuze and Guadagni and Antiochus, that functions as a, a mechanism of social repression through the agent of the family, right? So much so that we can actually miss that the family has a social context. Um, and they talk about this with like the father going to work. Is he still your father? Is he still a father in that, you know, they, the, the roles in the scripting have very clear limits, but, um, or you just switch it and say, no, he becomes the son, right? Um, but yeah, to get at your question, so this is where I think the fifth paralogism is actually very useful. Because, right, again, Freud's working through the Oedipus complex and laying out this Oedipal relationship. But it's not necessarily what has to be present, right? This could actually be a displacement enabled. Um, so the fifth paralogism on page 129 it is indeed in this sense that the idea of the afterward seemed to us to be a final paralogism in psychoanalytic theory and practice. Active desiring production in its very process invests from the beginning a constellation of somatic, social, and metaphysic relations that do not follow after psych Oedipal psychological relations, but uh, on the contrary, will be applied to the underlying Oedipal constellation defined by reaction, or else will exclude this constellation from the field of investment, constituting their activity. Undecidable, virtual, reactive, or reactional, such is Oedipus. It is only a reactional formation, a formation that results from a reaction to desiring production. It is a serious mistake to consider this formation in isolation, abstractly, independently of the actual factor that coexists with it and to which it reacts. Yes, this is what psychoanalysis does when it closets itself in Oedipus and determines its progressions and regressions in terms of Oedipus, or even the relationship to it. 
thus the idea of pre oedipal regression, by means of which one sometimes attempts to characterize psychosis. So one way of, of making a, a, uh, an understanding of this is that the use of Oedipus and the creation of things like Oedipal relationships, right? This is a way of taking what's happening in terms of desiring production, right? And understanding it through the Oedipal, right? So we can talk about things that go on in the institution, right? Kind of the institutional analysis, but it's not necessarily the case that it's an Oedipal formation there. What they're, I think one of the interesting things they're saying here though is, that's not to say the Oedipal formation is completely arbitrary at the same time, right? It's a reaction to what's going on, right? And they play on each other. It's one of the things I, I like about this. They affect one another. And the way, the way I take, especially the fifth, because the fifth, uh, the, the paralogism of the afterward is very much taken from Freud, and they talk about that pretty openly. Um, the, the big deal there to me, uh, to, I'm just going to read from Holland, is, uh, uh, let's see, where do I want to start this quote? Uh, the importance of real social and historical factors in psychic life is finally granted on this line of argument, but only insofar as they are understood to come after familial factors which form Oedipal subjectivity first during childhood. Quote, the child is father to the man, as the saying goes. Uh, real social relations are thereby construed merely as so many sublimations of Oedipal relations, which are supposed to be primary as well as universal. Uh, their, their critique here, and it is uh, the, the joke where everything is, uh, you know, father, everything is mother. Those are the sublimations that... Uh, that Freud talked about when he talked about uh, the afterward, I believe, actually. Um, I, I, I do. I think that, that a lot of that came from Freud. Someone needs to remind me if I'm wrong. Uh, but it's this idea of the sublimation of any of these uh, sort of repressions, any of these things that expand out. Everything becomes, you know, mommy, daddy, me, as I was saying. That's that final step. And then suddenly the family, which is a social institution completely, it's not, it's not, pre-subject, it's not anything. It's a social institution that exists only in that level, uh, ultimately is a capitalist institution, to be perfectly frank, uh, because of its time over time as they go through in uh, chapter three. The, the issue becomes that uh, because of the afterward, it's the, where we place the onus of our subjectivity in the same way that we have a difficult time talking about where I am at or my subjectivity we're talking about where all of my oppression comes from. It comes in this because of the afterward. That's the paralogism. The idea is it comes after all of this. And the reality is, no, these things don't come from there. They actually spout pre-subject. Did that, did that make sense, Al Dreams? Yeah, that helps a lot. Yeah, um, I guess. Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, it sounds like there's there's like an original connection. Uh, this desiring production is, you know, it's not just limited to the family, but it kind of spills out onto society and it's got metaphysical aspects to it. And the family's there, too, obviously. But then there are also all these partial objects. And I guess I'm wondering, is that just a way of saying there is this pre-individual field and that's where desire lives and that's where it sort of it starts. Uh, and Freud is just ignoring that. He's just starting with the individual in a way. Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, we're kind of putting Simondon terms here. So as I understand it, like the point is to say like the person... So when we're talking about the machinic and the productive, right, and desiring production and that kind of vitalism, which they lay out more in chapter three, what they're getting at is also how this stuff is produced, right? So one could start with the unconscious, with the ego, superego, and the, um, the id. How could I forget the id? 
uh, those three elements and find the Oedipus complex in relation to that. But that doesn't really tell us how all of this is produced, right? How did this stuff get here? Um, with desiring production and this idea of the unconscious and the autopoetic sense, we're seeing how it's producing itself and how this stuff has this recipro reciprocal relationship, right? So um, with desiring machines, the machinic is in relation to the um, to the vitalism, right? These two th forces or um, these two aspects work with one another, right? The, mach the machinic production is enabled by the vitalist flows of the desiring production, or rather of desire, in the same way that those flows enable the machinic production. So if by pre-individual we mean like, um, I always struggle here because <laughs> um, I think the thing is to say, right, like we're not starting with the person and looking to explain what the person um, is, right? We're talking about the things that function to produce that person. And in that sense, right, like something like the third synthesis with the subjectivities that are produced, um, I think that's shown when we understand in terms of the, the contrast with how we usually talk about the return of the repressed. I think that hi uh, highlights the point really nicely. Oh, for sure. Well, and, and again, their critique of Freud is not necessarily turning everything upside down. They basically are looking at Freud and going, oh, shit, it, libido. Yes, because that's like Freud came up with this idea or a lot of people did. But Freud's like famous for it there that we have this desire inside of us that, that there's this impetus, this force. And it's a really amazing way to think about things. But then. The problem is he basically gave desire, gave libido a mind, a, a, like a subject. Like it, it knows what things are and it understands how the world works in really complex ways, which is weird that it does that before a baby even has an understanding of the world. It's, it knows who mommy is. It knows daddy. It knows about sex. It knows about, you know, distrust. Like these are things that just is weird. Why would you do that? And so they're like, wait, what if we were to take desire and just, take it as pure, uh, the libido as this thing that just wants, it just goes and how it connects and here's how it functions. And so the, they're kind of taking Freud and taking him further, just very much like they did with Marx. I don't actually, I don't think they, you know, they didn't come at Marx like saying, oh, Marx got it wrong. They're like, no, no, he didn't go far enough. That's kind of their critique with everyone as they use the phrase. Uh, it's like a, someone who blasts with explosive the pylons all four at the same time. So that way the, the columns fall directly back into the hole with which you just exploded. And it's like, that's what their critique is. You just didn't go far enough. You're playing within the same core structures of things. So specifically, uh, let's take uh, Oedipus. The, the family basically is the recoding of desire. Desire exists. We recode it into things we're taught. That is the repressive thing and the, the repression of all of these paralogisms and how they function because afterward we have, oh, this is my mom. This must be who I want to fuck. This is my dad. This must be who I want to kill. All of these things happen after the fact, but because of the, the, the syntheses and how they function and really my subjectivity coming after them and I believe these things are me, all the issues that are created with all of this, I very much take as also, that's me. Uh, I don't really have the ability to filter them out. I'm just a subject. That's all I am. Nothing special. Yeah, I remember my first subjectivity. Uh, such a young age. Um, where do we go from here? So let's go back to um, all dreams. A question about like a civilization's discontents and start talking about more of what the fifth paralogism can actually like some of the states here. Sweet child of mine. I hate that song, Ken. Man. Just ruined my day. No, okay. So 
one of the aspects here is the, the role of investment, right? To go back to the quote I read, but on the contrary, uh, it is indeed in this sense that the idea of the afterwards seemed to us to be a final paralogism in psychoanalytic theory and practice, active desire reproduction in its very process, and thus from the beginning a constellation of somatic, social, and metaphysical relations that do not follow after Oedipal psychological relations, but on the contrary will be applied to the underlying Oedipal constellation defined by reaction. So right, uh, the unconscious produces, right, the metaphysical relations, the desiring production is, um, is investing this constellation, and this will be applied to Oedipus, right, or Oedipus, um, or else will exclude the constellation from the field of investment constituting their activity, or Oedipus will exclude it, right? So it'll either be kind of subsumed, uh, or it'll be excluded here. What I want to focus on here really quickly is the role of investments, because I think this does help get at how change is possible, and actually even how like the Oedipal relationship, um, how there's actually like, it's not always the case, right? Uh, where do we go now? Damn you. Um, anyways. Okay. So with investment, right, we have the reactionary and the revolutionary. One of the aspects of this I really like that they're laying out here is that with these kind of relationships, with the ways things um, connect, there is a role of investments, right? They call this like the indices of love or love as an index, this collection of investments. Um, so love is in this sense kind of like a memory, interestingly enough, but not in the normal sense of a memory either, because it's a collection of investments, right? It almost sounds kind of Wall Street-like or economical, which is probably the point. Um, with this role of, uh, of investments of the reaction and revolutionary kind, and um, after I turn it over to someone else, I'll get some quotes out for you. But with the role of these investments, right, one of the things social repression, I think, does is it, is it directs the investments, or rather, it conditions what, how these investments are possible, right, so how new investments are possible. And it also conditions, um, I think social repression can also be said to be conditioning how these indices of love are going to actually, like, um, play upon production in that manner. It's also important to make sure that when we talk about uh, the uh, investments, uh, individual investments, societal investments, like these things, as we talk about them, molar and molecular investments, these are not things that exist in different strata for different things. Uh, instead, they all are things that exist on the body without organs. Uh, this is uh, all centered around the pre-subject and exists there. That uh, the the quote would be molecular desiring machines are in themselves the investment of large molar machines, or of the configurations that desiring machines form according to the laws of large numbers. Uh, so at the extremely large scale, again we have to remember they're talking about when they say regimes or they talk about social or any of this, we're ultimately still talking about at that basic level desiring machines and how they're connecting and how these processes are functioning. We're just talking about them in massive numbers. Uh, and that's why they talk about the molar versus the molecular. Just really important because as we talk about uh, how repression begins to work on desiring machines in the individual and one's investment, say, in a, a social machine or uh, in social investments or molecular or molar investments, all of that, it, it's not a a two ordered system. We're not talking about, oh, society likes this and the society's beaut. No, it's all about it's all about you effectively, all about the BWO. Yeah, and that that's very important because the BWO, right, it's the potential for a sort of um so right, the BWO is the potential for revolutionary and reactionary investments within the in relative desiring production. And in that way, it allows for a way of investing in the social field, potentially. But it's also invested in by the social field, right? So this is really important because 
social production and desiring production play on one another, the molecular and the molar, right? And in doing so, we find ways of effect that they there's a, pen, a potential to affect one another just as they are effective. But that doesn't always mean one is better than the other, right? So social production is not necessarily a bad thing any more than the molecular is a good thing. Uh, yeah, there's more. So. I mean, it, okay. it's these things can't be extricated from each other. The social machines are the interaction of large scales of desiring machines that are working in conjunction with the subjectivity created and then those subjects interacting. Like we're talking about a system that simply is not something we can get away from. Like this is none of this is for us to, oh, I want to get rid of my BWO or all social like even social repression or in psychic repression is all bad. It's not. This is not like good and bad is not the way to think of any of these things. It's a, this is the forms and the process that we all sort of experience in becoming. Yeah. Uh, and so with that, right, because it's really important because they're going to talk about creating a new socius at the end of this book, right? So there's a, a lot of potential for change and they talk about the body without organs in chapter four as having potential for this and also having potential um, to sort of, I don't want to say protect oneself, but to have a certain, to enable capacities that social repression otherwise could really quash or to at least um, sort of give you a refuge in relation to that, right? Um, so I, I promise to quote, here are the goal of uh, schizoanalysis. To analyze the specific nature of the libidinal investments in the economic and political spheres, and thereby to show how, in the subject who desires, desire can be made to desire its own repression, whence the role of the death instinct in the circuit connecting desire to the social sphere. All this happens not in ideology, but well beneath it. An unconscious investment of a fascist or reactionary type can exist alongside a conscious revolutionary investment. Let me read that again. An unconscious investment of a fascist or reactionary type can exist alongside a conscious revolutionary investment. Inversely, it can happen rarely that a revolutionary investment on the level of desire coexists with a reactionary investment conforming to a conscious interest. In any case, Conscious and unconscious investments are not of the same type, even when they consider, I'm sorry, even when they coincide or are superimposed on each other. We define the reactionary unconscious investment as the investment that conforms to the interest of the dominant class, but operates on its own account, according to the terms of desire through the segregative use of the conjunctive synthesis from which edifice is derived. Namely, I am of the superior race. The revolutionary unconscious investment is such that desire, still in its own mode, cuts across the interest of the dominated, exploited classes and causes flows to move that are capable of breaking apart both the segregations and their edifical applications, flows capable of hallucinating history, of reanimating the races in delirium, of setting continents ablaze. No, I am not of your kind. I am the outsider and the deterritorialized. Quote, I am of a race inferior for all eternity. I am a beast, a Negro, end quote. Page 45, for those of you wondering. So as we step into and start talking about these molar investments and the molecular investments, uh, I want to also quote from Holland here because it's important to understand how these interplay and how these interact because it's really how repression comes to be formed by these large social machines. Uh, they call uh, the socius basically say they say works on uh, aggregates, statistical regularities, uh, herd instinct. Uh, that all of this exerts strong selective pressure on molecularity to limit its multiplicity and shape it to prevailing, 
prevailing forms of sovereignty. sovereignty. Molecular desire is what is given. Uh, the, the nature of the social systems, especially the ones we're in, uh, the hierarchies, the setups, and all of them uh, are able to take our desires thanks to the process that Oedipus actually utilizes, but it's not just Oedipus, there's a lot of them, by signifying and telling us what we do and do want as whole objects uh, and how things are intended to be related, that I have, again, the relationship with my mother and father as a child, when that's familial and very contingent, but instead now that's how everything is related. I'm related to everyone based on my status as an American. Here is how I'm supposed to handle all of this. Uh, my desiring machines, as I go through life uh, and I grow, will relate things as they so choose. Uh, as it, really, the, the schizo process of all of this is that we can relate all sorts of partial objects and find wondrous and interesting connections between things on a global level. But that these social uh, processes, this herd instinct, as they called it, or I think they used uh, gregarity at one point, uh, begins to shape molecular desire through the use of repression and anti-production inside of the syntheses and uh, the paralogisms. Uh, so suddenly these, these large-scale things, uh, for example, ideology, uh, Sylvia, as you bring up, would be uh, one of these molar investments. Uh, the way that they speak about molar investments would be very similar to Zizek's conception around how he talks about ideology, that these these large-scale social norms and ex expectations that I have, the, the way I see things relating, uh, the only time that that steps out and is something that I notice, the only thing really things I notice in life are when I don't notice the relation between them, when uh, I have mommy, daddy, me, I have man or woman, and suddenly a trans woman uh, uh, comes in my view. They use an example of, I think, much later in the book, uh, and I think I linked to it, uh, one of the better sort of takedowns that they had, um, I'm trying to remember, was it Lacan, who had a patient who his father uh, uh, really did not like uh, the, the uh, trans women that he saw driving around. Uh, it turned out he, he realized it's because his father actually desired them. But this sort of way that, that we're able to see things based on we don't understand the relation because it's not our molecular and our molar investment it is not how we see the relationality it's not how our repression has worked is one of the causes for what we would call ideology in this Zizekian sense which is a cool word to say if you ever want to say something that's Zizekian feels cool to say um that's how I relate them so uh that's there we go I I can't speak to Zizek there I just don't know his work well enough but the big thing for me is the ideology of secondary for them. And it's arguably, as I understand, ideology is pre-conscious. So what's happening in the unconscious productively is not determined by ideology. In fact, ideology um, at the pre-conscious level isn't really uh, an unconscious thing to begin with, right? So that's how, like, I've, I've criticized elsewhere Richard Wolff in this manner where like uh, the pre-conscious or something like an ideology um, doesn't really help us with what, what's happening unconsciously. So uh, my understanding is usually because when he talks about ideology, it's in the realm and the use uh, that Marx did as well. Um, it is uh, social concepts that push uh, false ideas onto people. Yeah, and so, okay. So I, I can actually comment on that. Um, they say, and this is in relation to right, right? They want to point out that ideology, the masses being tricked, is not what caused them to desire fascism, right? So there's a very clear crit criticism of using ideology to explain that uh, right there. And I, I, apparently Wright seems to seems to agree with them on that one. I, I do, too. Uh, I think where I tend to equate them and it may it may just be me and I may be completely insane is um, uh, ideology comes across and I, I begin to get indoctrinated into it at an early age. Uh, 
these take place in terms of large scale molar investments that happen within the social machines, especially in the triangulation of mommy, daddy, me, or in my familial situation that I'm around. The repression that is part of that ideology, the rules, the, the styles, the reality that I'm supposed to accept is taught to me as signifiers, which uh, over time uh, begins to uh, basically fuck with my natural desiring machine process, change my syntheses, and create a series of paralogisms that reinforce the ideology itself. So it's not so much that I'm being tricked at all. I wouldn't use the term tricked. It's uh, because of the nature of ideology, because of the nature of these large uh, social machines uh, telling me how things work and what things are, the, the paranoiac machine inside of me that is part of the process, the desiring machines wanting to attach to these things that it knows, these seeing the BWO, seeing how things are, you know, having things uh, laid out for me on the BWO very cleanly, the desiring machines are happy to try to attach to those. The paranoiac machines, as they talk about, are constantly, basically it's all they want and are repelled constantly by the BWO. And this is what causes that sort of paranoiac demand for knowledge and certainty. And uh, that is sort of the, to me, the nature of Zizekian ideology is the demand for certainty uh, within how I see the relations of signs around me is what causes uh, the sort of self-reinforced wave of, well, this this explains things and I just need it to continue to explain things and I need it to continue to explain things because of comfort, nostalgia, and all the things that they talk about paranoiac machines driving towards. So that's how I relate them. Um, okay, that's actually really useful here because I think that actually gives us a way to to talk about investment and ideology there. Because it sounds like we could argue then that Zizek, for him, ideology, he is dealing with at a pre-conscious level. Uh, I imagine he would probably disagree. But we could talk about no, that. no. He, his, his, his allegory he always uses uh, that I love is the movie They Live, where he talks about uh, the, the glasses that the guy puts on and suddenly he can see the world as it is. Uh, and he says they are glasses of ideology. <laughs> it's... Uh, this ability to see the signs as things are presented to us and the reality behind them. And so it's, he definitely is talking about uh, the implications of it on a pre-ideological, uh, a pre-subject level, on an unconscious level. I don't necessarily agree with how he thinks that the unconscious necessarily works. I'm not super bought into the Lacanian side, but I don't think it's necessarily, you know, oil and water to what Deleuze and Guattari here are saying. It's, it's very similar in terms of overall functionality. Mm -hmm. But let's just suppose them now. Okay, so as, as I'm as I'm thinking about it, ideology is at this pre-conscious level, or it's secondary in the unconscious, right? How and I I don't know Zizek well enough to, to precisely place him in that formulation, but what I can say is then for Deleuze and Guadri, right? It's not that ideology um, is exactly the problem or the answer, right? So it's not a problem of like um, having something that tells you what it all means. More so, it's these investments, I think. And this is important because, as I understand ideology, it's sort of it's sort of fixed. Right? I, mean, I don't know how much change is in ideology because it always seems like we have ideologies to respond to when ideologies fail, like templates. Yeah. Um, the point I would make here is. That for Deleuze and Guadri, what's more primary, right? Because ideology would be produced here, and, and I'm driving at that. What's more primary is the role of the investments, which don't necessarily um, conform to one another, right? You can have an unconscious, and you can have, um, right? So we're talking about love and the indices. You can have revolutionary reactionary investments in that index, right? You can have when the the distribution, when uh, the, the falling back on production occurs, you can have reactionary and revolutionary investments side by side there, right? And that's not an ideological problem. That's a productive um, happening. Okay. Uh, one of the jokes Zizek likes to tell, as he tells many, is uh, a man goes into a coffee shop and he says, uh, I would like my coffee black, no cream, please. And after a few moments, they bring his coffee and they say, Sir, I'm sorry, we're out of cream. Can it be without milk instead? 
uh, this is his sort of wordplay and joke about how uh, the assumption around how we see the world and what a thing necessarily is, coffee without cream, for example, ultimately is just black coffee. Also, it's coffee without milk. Technically, it's coffee without urine or semen or oil. It's coffee without a million things. How, how we view the world is uh, through that sort of uh, setup of language. Again, he's Lacanian in tradition. Um, I want to say also uh, Althusser, uh, which I never can pronounce correctly. I feel like you know, the cat from Looney Tunes, Althusser, whenever I say it. But uh, this idea of you know, language being the structure, all of that stuff. But I think that generally speaking, when we talk about how repression functions and social machines function for Deleuze, we're not in a drastically different ballpark in terms of pure functionality. When we have something like, for example, Oedipus. Oedipus is a signifier without anything that's been produced by desiring machines. Uh, it's, it's not, it can exist, but it's not a large-scale social reality. But when we tell people it is, just like coffee without cream is how you need to order it, not coffee without milk, this creates the, oh, what I wanted in that moment, and I have my moment of displacement in the syntheses through the paralogism of, you know, displacement through the paralogism of the afterward, the entire process. Uh, my ideology informs that the way that I see the relation of coffee to cream, because of those separate signs that have existed on my BWO and the machinic semiotics that they've laid out throughout this book and their others, the meaning of that to me is very particular as a subject. But when suddenly it also has a meaning as a large scale social machine, for example, coffee without cream being a very specific set of things, just like Oedipus, just like mommy, daddy, me, uh, suddenly the pressure that exerts on my desiring machines is massive. It's massive and it's pointed and it's very particular. And it's able to basically create the desire for it where it's very possible in Zizek's joke that a man may respond and say, you don't have cream. I have no desire for coffee without milk and get up and leave. And that's kind of the repression that they're talking about. So first of all, that's very interesting. And again, I don't know his work well enough, but it, it does sound to me there that you are talking about the pre-conscious level. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the point is there that that doesn't change the production of them, of the pre-conscious, right? So this is where I, I even criticized Wolf for this, right? One could argue that his idea of the co-op is a pre um, a preconscious change, an ideological change, however you like, and in that he's not actually changing how these things are produced per se, or he's not aware of how he's changing the production, right? And this is really where it gets interesting, right? Um, similarly, with ideology, right, the production of ideology, but more so the production of uh, production, as we always go back to. This is where I think. The potential lies for Deleuze and Guattari. So in, in that example, right, um, which I really appreciate because every time I order coffee, I have to specify black. I've never, it's the norm not to, not to order it black. So <laughs> um, I like that joke a lot. I, I find that pretty uh, refreshing. But anyways, for this, uh, this role of investments there, right, something can be pre-consciously revolutionary and unconsciously reactionary, right? And I've tried to talk about Wolf as an example of that. Let me use a contemporary one that I've been going over in my head, um, which just happened with Wall Street Bats, actually. I, I wrote this off initially as just being like, yeah, I didn't really think anything of it because it's just people trying to make money. Right. So we could say there's a reactionary pre-conscious thing about how do I make money? How do I make, right. All these guys came together to, um, to invest and to do, um, um, a short sink, I think it's called anyways, to, to basically, um, take advantage of what's going on in the stock market and, um, to, to basically, um, exploit a shorting, a mass shorting. So to me, this sounds like you know, we could call this class interest, right? We could call this playing the stock market is usually pretty bourgeois in my experience. <laughs> um, what's interesting to me is this to me does seem pre-consciously uh, sort of reactionary, right? They're not really trying to change the stock market. They're trying to change, um, they're just working with what's there, right? There's not really 
an interest in, in, in a lot of change. What's been interesting about it is I've begun to think there is an unconsciously, an unconscious revolutionary investment that they've made because the way this is being taken, right, the way this has affected um, the institutions, primarily the hedge funds, but also investors, the way subjectivities have actually kind of changed, where all of a sudden you've got people involved in hedge funds talking like they're proletariat, talking like they're impoverished people, right? How are we going to afford this? You know, you guys are supposed to be like, how did you make, how did you make an, a short without having the money to back it up, right? Like, <laughs> you know, this is a, an incredible kind of reversal that, that's occurred. And that I think is showing us a certain change in the unconscious, right? A certain in revolutionary investment has been made. Um, and this is where I think you can see a limit of ideology. Is I don't think ideology is really what accomplished this any more than um, anything else pre-conscious here. I think what's actually changed is something at the unconscious level of production, which is very fascinating to me. Interesting. I would. So for me, the, the take on Wall Street bets is uh, for me, the, the overall investments we've been forced to basically take in and place in terms of our identity within the social machines that we take part in are siding with one or the other. That's basically where we've been placed. It's been deeply by univocalized because of the, I mean, the hierarchies we live under. Um, on one side, you're saying that uh, Jesus, this is not this unprofessional, these, these day traders ruining things. On the other side, it's people fighting hedge funds. And the reality is far more complicated and a bit more nightmarish than that, to say the least. Um, Just to jump in real quick, I'm not going to interrupt you very long. That's exactly what interests me, though, that all of a sudden the people who are doing this investment, right, we usually talk about investing as this bourgeois privilege thing, yeah. It's fascinating to me that the people on Wall Street bets can even be considered as having turned the tables, as having done all of this when they're doing the same thing uh, the hedge funds do in a certain sense, right? It's, it's you know, there's the, the difference, the difference that's been created is really fascinating to me right there. Well, or you could say that what happened is that uh, the guy who's basically the activist investor behind GameStop who was going to lose his shirt very soon when all those shorts came in, uh, found a way to basically convince people to put up their earned money in a way that no hedge fund would because their whoever did it is going to lose fortunes. And people did. A lot of normal human beings lost shit tons of money buying in GameStop stock at $100 a share, $200, $300 a share, thinking it was going to be this huge thing the numbers, if you watched Wall Street bets, the, the screenshots were extraordinary. And the numbers that showed that people were doing this, not just there, but people across the country. And it was because they were like, cool, this is the story. It's us fighting back. I can take part in this. This is also a system for me. And the reality is it absolutely isn't. And what happened yeah. from the beginning is they got played. They got played hard. Uh, they got played really, really, really hard. And... Mm -hmm. the the so to me the way that that functions is the stories that necessarily need to be told again from a social machine perspective say reddit or social media in general which is you know the social machine par excellence terrifying all of them the way that they fueled that and the way they went they were inscribing ultimately all of these people were inscribing their stories and the relations between themselves, their class structure, where they were at, their relationship to money, their relationship and opposition of capital, all, they were assigning the relations between all of these partial signs on the BWO. That's the nature of how they saw themselves and where they placed themselves as a subject moving around on their BWO. They triangulated fucking super hard right there. And it's not so much that this happened post subject, this is all happens pre-subject. This is part of the machinic unconscious. But the way that it plays out is through these larger social structures and larger social narratives in this case. And what I would call ideology of the situation where anyone who was on Wall Street bets, if someone posted something that was, for example, a post about uh, 
how this is proof of Wall Street in over their head for a trillion dollars in illegal, you know, shareholding and counterfeit shares. There's some crazy shit that's been the top thing on that uh, subreddit for the last few days. Uh, anything that's in line with their ideology, how they see and understand their references to science, how their social machine operates, mm -hmm. that went straight to the top. Anything that was in opposition, right to the bottom. Vice versa, on the other side, people had assumptions around how the wealthy would react to this. And it was fun to watch a few billionaires be you know, very scared about where they were at. But the reality is this is actually how all of those people talk. Anyone who's a manager of a hedge fund for billions of dollars actually does have the stress of worrying whether or not they're going to lose everything all the time. It's, uh, it's a weird thing. That it's not like they sit there and go, excellent, life is great. They're all stressed and weirdly in a nightmarish, semi-proletarian place. It's very weird to watch. But like the, these, these stories are part of that large-scale social machine that causes the social repression that reinforces itself, as you're talking about, where they go, instead of like going sideways and finding new connections that are outside of the system and building an apparatus in a different direction, they were more than happy to jump in and go, I get to be part of it too. And uh, no, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. But this is my, and this is my, my criticism and my agreement with you is where you say it's like the ideology that I agree because that's the pre-conscious level, which I've already designated as reactionary, right? Especially with them jumping on, this is that, gregarious aspect what's interesting to me here in terms of the unconscious where the revolutionary seems to be is that there does seem to be a certain cutting across of social codes here so much so that we're seeing people who i was always under the impression who had billions of dollars complain that they can't afford it short, to pay the short <laughs> which is the very you know they will always hear like oh you know you're not supposed to take the risk if you can't afford it and here they are um having done that, right? The subjectivity is here. Well, There's so a I'll, change I'll, in subjectivity. I'm, I'm going to agree that I think the, the nature of the unconscious, I don't think is necessarily paranoiac or the pre-conscious. I, I think there's a tendency towards that, but it's specifically when we uh, buy univocalized concepts and realities. So when we sit here and we say, for example, here's what a short sell is, here is how this works, here's what our goal is, and here's our setup. And here's what we're going to do as Wall Street bets and I, as your fearless leader, and there's a few of them, uh, uh, short fucking stocks, I think is one of their names on Reddit. Uh, as soon as that happens, that's it. There was perhaps a, a gem inside of this of some sort of schizo quality of, of randomness and connection where some people like really were going and didn't sort of stumbled into this accidentally, but then it became defined. Then it became a thing at that moment. It switches completely to the paranoiac side of the, of the poll, a hundred percent, not even a question. So I don't fully agree with the analysis. Um, although I think you're making some really good points. The, uh, the reason I don't fully agree is because I think at that pre-conscious level, that was kind of like the plan from the, that was going to happen from the beginning, right? It was a pre-consciously uh, reactionary thing um, in my mind. So I, I think we agree there. And I, I consider that to be part of the ideology and even part of the gregariousness you're just, um, you're describing. But at the unconscious level, um, I do think a revolutionary investment might've happened. And I, when you say like the gem in that, this is what's interesting to me. I don't think a gem has been lost or created. I think the territory and the code is actually has actually changed in a certain sense, so much so that um, at least I see it in the subjectivities that we're seeing um, taking place. Now, because this has changed, right, and this is one of the ways I usually criticize authenticity, because that change has happened in terms of unconscious production, it can appear at the pre-conscious level that that something has been lost, but the territory itself has changed, right? And I don't think that's necessarily a loss or a gain. I don't think that's actually the question in the first place. What's interesting me is the change itself. So, uh, hello? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Sorry, we've been talking about, we've been just going back and forth, sorry. Yeah, no, just a, uh, just a clarification, actually. I'm really curious about this. Um, uh, so pre-conscious versus unconscious, I guess, versus conscious. 
um, I mean, Mandela, so when you, when you say those uh, terms, would you align them with different layers of the syntheses maybe, or would they kind of come, uh, like how, how, do, how to distinguish them in terms of Deleuze and Guattari's uh, terms? So the, the unconscious is where the syntheses are, right? The pre-conscious is sort of produced out of that. But at the same time, and this is usually how I, I criticize Wolf, right? We can focus on the pre-conscious, right? But that's not necessarily going to take us into how it's how it, the pre-conscious itself has been produced. This is actually why I don't I don't I don't personally use the Simondon language here, because I try to think about it more directly in this sense. Um, but yeah, the the three syntheses are happening in the production of the unconscious itself, pre-conscious. Um, sort of after that, yeah? Just like ideology being secondary as opposed to being a primary aspect of the unconscious. I guess I was wondering if uh, you, you might align the pre-conscious with the second synthesis and then consciousness with the third. Uh, I don't know, this is just a shot in the dark, but because I'm, I'm thinking of the whole aspect of coding and... Um, you know the way codes are kind of written on the um, uh, on the I guess on the socius or on the body without organs. There was this whole uh, somebody mentioned at one point like you know like a groove or like a record, and uh, and I'm wondering if we could call that preconscious maybe somehow or that ideology, and then like the pure unconscious really is just the machinic, just the the sort of the connections. But I mean, this is just a shot in the dark. So I, I would disagree with that. Um, and I would disagree with that because the three syntheses are the production of the unconscious, right? It's part of the autopoiesis. So to walk the pre-conscious into that would seem a mistake to me. Now, something like ideology would seem to me, you might be able to persuade me that ideology can be produced from those point signs on the body without organs or the socius. But the coding and the territorialization processes, that does seem to be unconscious processes to me. Um, so I, I would disagree with that. So I'll, I'll jump in real quick, Jack, because I, I don't know if I necessarily uh, follow the difference between how I've understood the difference when they say the word pre-conscious is they simply mean pre-subject. The, the unconscious is uh, almost in the way we're discuss, discussing it, a process. The unconscious is machinic. It is a machine. It is, it operates like that. The pre-conscious is simply that which precedes the subject. It's not necessarily a specific process or thing or any of that. It's, it's simply discussing about its place in time rather than specifically its nature. Whereas uh, the unconscious is discussing less its place in time and more the process and its form. Okay. So I take it to be the unconscious as that production, whereas the pre-conscious at that point, um, the productivity seems to have taken place, yeah? Um, something like, it's like the retrospective aspect of the, the so that's what it was, right? There does seem to be, right at that point, there seems to be a pre-conscious interest in the unconscious when you're when, in that retrospective sense. Um, so as I distinguish them, something like the, the ideology that I, I believe is in the pre-conscious, especially at that secondary level, would be produced by the unconscious, right? And it's it sort of at that conscious level, right? It, 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 it's kind of accessible consciously in that sense. And it's going to play into how consciousness, um, right, because it's pre-conscious, it's going to play into what consciousness will do. But in and of itself is not part of the unconscious in that sense, because the unconscious, like you're saying, is the machinic production.
I'm gonna have to do some reading on that. Because mm -hmm. that's um, so Jack there. All right. Uh, anyone else? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that. So, um, all right. Uh, we've gone off on a tangent here. I'm so sorry, everyone. But we we've, we've been talking through again just different relations around this. Please, uh, questions, comments, uh, type them away, ask them, unmute yourself. Uh, we're open. Unless someone has an idea where we want to go next. All right. Um, I don't really have much else to add. Uh, <sighs> this is so complicated. I think uh, our, our, our conversation on next week is going to be on socius's, uh, but we're going to specifically be talking about capitalist representation and how it plays into social repression. Uh, does anyone here at this point as we've talked about Oedipus, as we've talked about how social repression operates, what repression is, all of that. Do you have questions around these things? We are open. This is the time to ask. I'm perfectly fine. Any, no question is dumb. Everything's great. Let's ask because this is a part of the discussion. So Oedipus is not what's doing the repressing, right? It's the form of the repression. It's the apparatus. Yes, it's the it's a it's a social machine. It's a signifier that is not not literally doing the repression uh, that that's happening inside of your unconscious uh, through the use of anti-production and the issues with the syntheses and the paralogisms. Um, but it is a, a social investment, a, a, a unconscious investment that is causing those things to happen. So the answer is yes. Okay, yeah, also Paul's question. Uh, I'll just read it for him. Uh, I have a question about the molar molecular. At first, they talk about the molecular interactions to only form between... Uh, I don't know what you mean by POS, Paul. Partial objects. Oh, partial objects, strictly. Then later in the text, they adapt a new definition of molecular when they move the border between molar and molecular into the molar. Then the molecular became, becomes something between partial objects and large groups, but not necessarily the individual. They use this new form of distinction to differentiate between unconscious and pre-conscious. Did I get that right? Um, so yes, the partial objects are at the molecular level, I believe, and the social machines at the molar. Um, they adapt a new definition of molar and they move the border between molar and So, molecular. okay. I'm so what, sure what about Paul's that. talking about is kind of my understanding of pre-conscious and unconscious. Uh, so I, I think that's what you're kind of getting at, Paul. We, we were kind of dancing around this a little bit. Um, the, my understanding is uh, when we're talking about desiring machines, they operate in the unconscious. Pre-conscious is uh, basically our implication of what those machines want or how those machines are operating in the social sphere. So, for example, class. Class is a pre-conscious investment. Uh, it's not the same thing as an unconscious uh, investment or any of those things. Pre-conscious investment is class. How, how I deal with people in an alliance uh, or a not familial nature, uh, that, that sort of thing is pre-conscious. Um, that is also how I read it. Uh, Jack? Um... The trouble I have is I think of the molar and molecular as part of the unconscious. And that seems to be how you're, at least if I understand you correctly, Paul, how you're making the differentiation of the unconscious, the pre-conscious, is through the molar and the molecular. I may never know. Um, I want to read, I'll read a little bit from Holland here. The primacy of desire has important consequences for revolutionary strategy. 
as suggested by the second thesis of schizoanalysis, which distinguishes the unconscious libidinal investment of group or desire from the pre-conscious investment of class or interest. The, uh, the, the nature, it's very complex, Paul. Oh my God, this is, this is where we're going to start getting into the really fun stuff of uh, the first and second task of schizoanalysis, because that's where a lot of this is actually really, really discussed. So uh, I'm going to try to do my best. Um, generally speaking, subject groups pursue unconscious revolutionary breaks. Well, subjugated groups only manage pre-conscious ones, is the sort of setup as Holland sees sort of this, the thing, how he describes it. Uh, desire and interest always coexist, but do not necessarily coincide. Not only do objective and subjective interest often diverge, but more significantly for schizoanalysis, Unconscious desire and preconscious interest may not coincide. Preconscious investments may be revolutionary in content or objective, yet molar and repressive in form. Quote, a group may be revolutionary from the standpoint of class interest and its preconscious investments, but not be so, and even remain fascist and police like from the standpoint of its libidinal investments. Uh, the difference that they're trying to track here is that. Uh, and maybe I maybe misstated how I looked at pre-conscious earlier. But uh, the way we're talking about pre-conscious investments is they're talking ultimately about fairly whole objects or concepts. A pre-conscious investment in the Oedipal, a pre-conscious investment in the bourgeoisie or in the state or in the motherland or in Jesus or in, uh, in you know, uh, Islam, Ishallah, whatever you want to say. Uh, these are pre-conscious uh, investments. They tend to be related to fully whole objects, whereas actually from their libidinal investments, we may find that there are unconscious investments. The actual sort of desiring machine's molecular standpoint, it's not what they say that they are. Uh, it's it's a, the difference, and I will get into this, of what schizoanalysis is trying to do is to break down these, con these pre-conscious investments, these things that we believe in, the things that we are attached to, the thing, places that we believe we are a part of, our relations on the body without organs that we're seeing as sign relations and how we define ourselves, we break down those pre-conscious investments and really understand where our unconscious desiring machines are trying to connect and what, what we have possible. But are you suggesting that the molar and the social production uh, are the pre-conscious? No. Uh, okay. Because if I understand Paul, that's the suggestion there. And I, I don't, I might have to go back and look for some quotes, but I don't think the molar or the social production is the preconscious. No, I, they, they, the way that they talk about a lot of these things and the, the phrasing that they use, for example, is uh, they use preconscious when they are talking about Molar. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be very straight about their literal terminology. Preconscious, anytime they're talking about something that is molar, anything that is whole object, whole body, conceptual, large scale, social. Preconscious is the term. Unconscious, they seem to be using in terms of relation to the individual or the individual subject. Uh, the subject has an unconscious. Uh, society has a preconscious or I have preconscious as a subjectivized political actor. Uh, okay, you're reading it a little bit different than I am. I'm, th I'm thinking of social production and the molar as, as um, because they talk about the regimes and like this relationship um, where it's two ways of kind of talking about the same thing. I th I'm thinking of the molar and social production as uh, part of the, the production of the unconscious. So I, I, I'm not placing the molar or social production into the pre-conscious. I consider it to be um, as much in the unconscious as the molecular is. So the specific place that they divide the two uh, is essentially that the pre-conscious is the part of, I'm going to say us just because I'm going to use language I have to, the pre-conscious is what believes in things. That's, that's, the, the, that's the difference. Uh, to say, uh, it is doubtless true the psychoanalyst would be the first to say that everything considered, belief is not an act of the unconscious. It is always the preconscious that believes. Shouldn't even be said that it is the psychoanalyst who believes, the psychoanalyst in each of us. Uh, that's the only time inside of the book that I know of that they really start talking about preconscious investments and interests and separate it cleanly. 
Right, but are you moving to say that that pre-conscious aspect is the molar and is the solar uh, social production? No, I'm not. I'm saying that that is okay. in reference that when the subject is dealing with essentially himself or his own desires or his setups, he's not really in a place of belief. Uh, the investments are the thing a subject believes. The uh, the pre-conscious is where the uh, relational creation of uh, uh, you know, signifiers would sit. Uh, this is what uh, happiness looks like. This is what a job is. This is what family is. This, those are pre-conscious investments. They are not in direct relation to the subject, although the subject is what has them, but they are actually in relation to larger social machines. So they are a belief reference to those larger social machines playing in that space and utilizing that language uh, that is there. But the unconscious is actually where our signs and our actual desires come from. So it's not so much I'm saying that the pre-conscious, I don't believe, is a name for a thing happening at the molar at all. Uh, it's a thing that's happening in relation to the molar for sure. Yeah, okay. The, the only thing I'm can, yeah, it sounds like we agree then that the pre conscious is not necessarily um, social production then. Because that's the only part where I was, when I was reading. No, the no, 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 no. Like, no. Nah, I don't know about that one. No, no, I don't for sure. Um, manifest syntheses are merely pre conscious indicators of a degree of development. The apparent interests and aims are merely the pre conscious exponents of a social full body. That's where I'm placing it, the pre-conscious exponents of a social full body. Therefore, to me, the pre-conscious is the part of the subject that exists only in relation to that larger social full body, is not, is not the social full body, but it only exists in relation to that, whereas my unconscious essentially is individual in relation to the subject that I have been created as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like I, I agree with what Paul said. The pre-conscious should be where you get things like goals and aims, right? But that's not the unconscious. Right. Because, uh, again, the unconscious is uh, just basically desiring machines firing off, seeing what worked, trying to replicate it, do it again, constantly firing off. Signs are created. Relationships between those signs are formed. That larger thing is the body without organs. At some point, we have to create relations between the signs. These are the pre-conscious investments. That what it means to be a man is to have a beard, be tall, have a beautiful wife, have a family, a white picket fence. That is man, masculine, fight, all of these things. These are the investments in these large-scale things. They shape absolutely the subject, uh, my class, who I belong to and my setup. But if you break me down completely and you see where my unconscious desires are at and my actual desiring machines... This is where you can see the conflict and where you can see where the paralogisms are created uh, that sort of allow really fucked up and terrible investments on behalf of the pre-conscious. Well, you should be able to see like even something like ideology as a pre-conscious thing should only be possible, in my understanding, through the production of the unconscious, right? It's like the pre-conscious... As I'm thinking about it, right, it's produced by the unconscious in a certain sense, or rather, it's not possible without the unconscious's production. No, everything is ultimately desiring machines. It's desiring machines all the way down. But the way that they're formed and the way we discuss things on a social level, for example, on this podcast or as a society at large, what it means to be an American, these are words that we have to assign meaning to that have to have whole objects as part of it that flows the other direction. This is the nature of, of kind of the discussion we have around things, that these larger investments, what these words mean, what these things identify as, flow the other way. And my investment into them, my class, my race, my nation, whatever it may be, is dependent on my relationship with those things and is a product of kind of the large-scale social interactions. But those things ultimately only happen because they are all desiring machines all the way down. We're simply talking about the way that the subject deals with the two different regimes from their position as a as an individual in between them, basically. So when I step out of my world and I go, excellent, I want uh, 
I want a good job. I want a wife. I want a house. I want a kid. That, that kind of stuff. These are the pre-conscious investments. Now, what generates these and my investments into them is ultimately my desiring machines and the way that I've, you know, sort of lived my life. But the other part is the social repression that comes from these large scale stories and narratives that are told where I'm told here is how the things on your body without organs actually need to relate. These individual partial objects, this is what they are. A partial object of beard, that's, that's not feminine. That's only for men. And by the way, men means male. That means penis. That's the way that works. So this, my investment in all of these things is giving me on my BWO, telling me what my relations are are in my semi semiotics and that becomes dangerous for all of the ways I don't I hope I don't have to go into on this server um, but from my core sort of unconscious these things just connect as they do and I'm always in a process of becoming and finding my own relations within them this is the this is the challenge they talk about when they say that a person's pre-conscious investments you may see it and go well look at this 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 these people who are pro-trump people are all Working class schlubs who are getting fucked by everyone. There's no billionaire on the front lines there. The billionaires are laughing and taking the money. And it's like, yeah, but you need to see that they're, they're like investments are not a matter of their class. They're not a matter of where you see them in society or where really even society sees them. It's their underlying sort of desiring machines and how they've built these relationships and how the paralogisms have allowed them to interact with these large scale things that they've become invested. So you need to understand where their desiring machines are interacting at a basic level first. Yeah, that's interesting. You've definitely given me something to think about there. I, I suppose uh, I would be remiss not to think about it before responding. No, no, take your time. I'm, this is, uh, I've been trying to put together, uh, as I've been reading Proust and Signs, and I've been pre-reading Logic Ascents yet again, uh, the nature of their machinic semiotics is, is really what comes through here to me and the way people invest in them. So, for example, like Paul asked, uh, the schizo, does he have a pre-conscious? Well, of course, we, we have to have, like, it, in order to operate as a society, we have to have some level of things that tie us together. And my order of semiotics and my ability to talk through those things is limited by the nature of my experience doesn't match yours. I can't talk about my partial objects in the same way that you do if we were to evil do such a thing. So we have to agree generally on how words work and words tend to have implications because you know they're not hard, fast things as much as we want to pretend that they are. They're, they're not fully relational. We don't know everything that they contain. We have to kind of figure that out based on, again, our own signs that have been written on our own body of or, body without organs. So the unconscious process that the schizo has, it's much more, it's much less about saying, well, you can't have any investments. It's much more about understanding your own uh, semiotics, your own body without organs, your signs that you've met with, allow them to connect in ways where you're not thinking or embracing the idea of these larger investments to allow yourself to make lateral movements and to do things that are very different and nomadic in terms of how you behave in your everyday life. That's a, that's the, the fascist does the opposite. They go, excellent. If I want my friends to like me and I want people to like me and I want this and that and this, uh, it's, it's not that they think this, but they learn over time that if I'm going to be part of this, I have to believe like everyone else. And here's what they believe. Although none of them do. Like no one believes half of this shit that you talk about. If you sit someone down, you go, excellent. Uh, if you had a farm with 15 people on it, they're all your family. At some point, the guy who's in charge of the uh, cows creates a cow machine that does all the work. Does he starve to death? Like, that's the question. Like, no, of course not. We'd take care of him. He's family. It's like, cool. So let's extrapolate that. Like, people don't believe these things when you give them real specific realities around stuff. They believe the stories because the stories and the semiotics work in a very particular way. It's a, I'm now rambling a little bit, but this has been my, like, drive with with the last year as we've really gotten into this, uh, sort of, this has been crystallizing. And I, like I said, I don't want to venture too much of a response without thinking this over more, but um, what I'll risk is that it still sounds like, and maybe this is something to do a round table on, is more directly getting into the pre-conscious and the unconscious there. Because, um, even something like belief there or the way we work with signs, especially if we're going to talk about 
signs and like the signifying sounds, right? That does seem to me to broach the un uh, to broach the pre-conscious, more especially the conscious. Um, whereas the very production of the unconscious, where the body of the organs has the point signs um, and the territories and the codifications are happening, that in and of itself seems to me to be entirely unconscious. So much so that we, um, right, the subjects are on those, subjects have their positions in those territorialities, right, in those zones, those intensities, um, and it would seem to me that that all is unconscious, whereas at the pre-conscious level, something like an ideology, something like a belief, um, that would seem to me to be only possible after all that's been produced. Right, and so like, um, even with class interest or ideology, so, or even with like the where I criticize the worker co-op thing, there does seem to be a certain tension there to me because we're focusing on, um, not on the production of these things more directly, but we're starting with the pre-conscious more primarily. So. so yeah, I mean, we could have a long discussion. I'm kind of down to do that right now if you want, um, because it's it's a really uh, fine point. But uh, to me, the pre-conscious is where our interests come in, and it's where we generate the meaning of relations between signs that uh, uh, we look at as subjects, and we say, excellent, this is my interest due to the miraculity machine. Subjectivization comes after the pre-conscious, and we see these interests as, uh, excellent, this is what I want to do, but it's... These, these interests are not the raw desire. These interests are symbols of it, signs of the raw desire. Um, it, everything gets completely fucked up. Instead, what the reality is we're talking about like things that are at the same point, possibly reactionary and revolutionary all at once. Uh, and so the pre-conscious is gummed up because of this. And so uh, the, the, the subject uh, that we're talking about inside of this process uh, the us, the me, uh, I may have my interests, I may have my goals for what I want to do and all of these things. I believe this is what my desires are. They're not. These are the signs that are the relations of, these are the, uh, sorry, signifiers of the signs uh, that are built because of the relations between sides on my BWO that are put there because of my design machines. And I need to really look at what my desires are in order to understand these things. That's like that's the line where I see the pre-conscious coming in. Because um, the pre-conscious investments basically are, and I don't want to, it's not always this, this is going to be terrible, but um, they are the thing that hides desire. They are the things that hide what I really, like underneath, and desire is the wrong word, my libidinal energy, my passions, my sense of life, and my, inv my investments, the, my interests, they they are uh, me desiring when we have people in these chats and they go, but wait, I, I do want to eat. I do want these things. It's like, yeah, yeah that's that's a pre-conscious investment. That is the pre-conscious interest. I want, uh, I have some water I'm going to take a drink of. And as I mute this, that's the pre-conscious investment. The subject still comes after, and I believe that those investments are mine. But what creates and plays within those is both the social and the social repression that comes in, as well as my actual desiring machines firing off. The social repression causing the paralogisms, this sort of thing collapsing into what becomes my pre-conscious investments. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, yeah, to say one I'm more time in a real simple way, uh, desiring machines and the three syntheses create a bunch of stuff. Let's say that that is uh, the unconscious and let's call it X. Uh, let's just call it the unconscious. The second part is pre-conscious. Pre-conscious are interests. The, the things when the subject after the miraculating machine goes uh, and the subject gets to goes, oh, this is what I want. I'm into this. I want to go for these things. They're ref the subject is referring to the pre-conscious. Subject isn't referring to the unconscious. It can't do that. Uh, but the pre-conscious is not just the result of like only the unconscious as a process itself. Part of that unconscious is 
all of these other social repression social machines that are basically tickling it and tossing things in. Here's a sign, here's a signifier, here's this, you want this, blah, blah, blah. And that's where the, the works get gummed up. That's where the, the particulates inside of the flows are introduced that fuck things up. And that process uh, that comes from the unconscious with the paralogisms, with all these problems, everything that comes with it, it creates those interests. And the interests are what I'm referring to as a subject when I say I want to continue having this discussion because Jack, this is important to me. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's still difficult for me there because I'm I'm still having trouble. I feel like I'm having trouble following your differentiation between the two. Um because something like an ideology, right, that should only be possible as the pre-conscious um, because the unconscious production has taken place and made that possible, right? An ideology should be contingent on that, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'm not saying it's not. Uh, so let, let's remove ideology. Let's just talk about literally the functionality of the unconscious, pre-conscious and the subject and social repression. Because all four of these things are things that interact inside of the philosophy that we've seen inside of AO. Uh, the the large-scale social interaction, the socius, all of these things uh, create signifiers. They create repression. They create very specific things that I need to be invested in. The unconscious doesn't invest in anything. The unconscious is just going about its day, connecting, disconnecting, miraculating. That's what it does over and over and over. Uh, so where does it get something like Oedipus? Like that would be my question to you then. Where where does it get the Oedipalization? Like how does that enter? That would be the repressing representation. Um, right. I'm not talking about how it's produced. You're talking about how it's produced. I'm asking where does it enter? Like how does it get where? I'm not born knowing what Oedipus is. At some point someone says, hey, you shouldn't fuck your mom. Now, what happens there? Because my, my desire machines don't understand fuck, mom, shouldn't. No clue. The unconscious does not speak this language. So how does it interact as a function with that sentence, with that statement, with that signifier? You're asking me, how does the unconscious interact with Oedipus? Yes. How does the apparatus of Oedipus that exists, at, can we agree Oedipus is a social machine effectively? Uh, I think it was a representation, but, but let's let's just keep going. Either way, um, either way works. Uh, how does the actual moment inside of the unconscious, what connects to it? How does it connect? Like, what is the actual place that it is produced inside of the machinic unconscious? Um, so as I think about it, Oedipus should condition certain investments. And those investments should play into what is produced and reproduced in the unconscious, right? So the generative role can be affected by um, the representation of Oedipus because if the, through the fifth paralogism, right, the, um, or more so through the fourth and fifth paralogism, my take on it would be that uh, through the displacement of that, that recording and that investing can affect how the unconscious is going to produce. And that displacement should, if I'm not mistaken, be one of the things that enables the fifth um, the fifth paralogism, because now that the displacement has occurred and production and reproduction are changing in that manner, one should be able to construct a certain, um, like they say, one should be able to construct um, around Oedipus in that manner. Right. Again, though, I'm asking... Because uh, I'm all of that I, I tend to agree with, but where does it actually affect the unconscious? Because that, that leap where it's like, okay, so the pre-conscious exists. The pre-conscious only exists after the unconscious. It is not part and parcel of that process. The pre-conscious investments necessarily have to because, again, desiring machines can't deal with whole objects. They, they only deal with partial objects. And investments can't be partial objects. Investments are only whole objects. So there's a there's a gulf there. The whole objects can't interject and start fucking with like like where do they go backwards? 
how do they get into that would be my question because yes they can affect and that's what i'm talking about is how that affection happens to me that happens mm -hmm. because when i have my investment in a large scale uh sort of i look out and i go oh oedipus this is everything is mommy daddy blah blah, blah. I, i'm told this is how you need to behave with your father your father is a strong man who controls your life you need to accept that your mother is a sex object you don't get to fuck and your dad's your rival for that that's the way it works in order to have a healthy life you have to have a new wife this is the like shitty psychoanalysis now this process of telling me what things are and how i should desire what it does is it it causes the bwo to have forced relationships between signs so when the desiring machines uh, and the paranoiac machines start looking at the BWO, as they do all the time, and they go, oh, BWO, you're so sexy. I've seen so much of you before. I really want this stuff. Uh, and the BWO is like, no, stay away. The desiring machines in that process, they start seeing mommy. They start seeing, you know, having these relations set up and by univocalized, this is the only way these things can connect is essentially how it begins to work. Everything has to be the mommy, daddy, me triangle. That's how Oedipus fucks with and starts inserting itself onto the BWO. It forces triangulation in between these signs that are, you know, that are placed in sort of random order wherever they are in the BWO. That forced placement, that shift in the BWO because of my investments is what causes that retroactive change in how my desiring machines interact and then create the paralogisms that then reinforce the machine over time through the various, uh, you know, for, from the afterward, for the displacement, wherever it may be. Uh, Oedipus plays on pretty much all of them. Uh, this is, to me, how the functioning occurs. And this can be brought out across the board to kind of everything where it's, here is what a man is, is necessarily repressive because it's, I mean, by saying that, I've, you're saying here is how the, the semiotics need to relate in order to create a man. Uh, this is what Oedipus, this is what society demands. This is what freedom is. Uh, it's, uh, it's how you end up with people who have uh, blue line, you know, American flags and also don't tread on me flags on the same truck. It's extraordinary, but it's because they've been forced to by univocalize all of these signs and have a very particular relation between each other. This changes their investments, which is pre-subject, and that's where these things get regenerated over and over through those paralogisms. Jeez, man, you're giving me a lot to respond to. I know. Sorry. It's. It's. I wish it was, dude. I wish this was the kind of thing I could say in three sentences. Trust me. Uh, premise by premise. Okay. Uh, let me try and respond. Um, so, as I understand it. Uh, Oedipus, in this sense, as a representation of that, is going to affect how the unconscious produces and reproduces. But Deleuze and Guadi are very clear that Oedipus isn't produced by the unconscious either. Um, it's something that's created through this, um, through their account of universal history, right? These social machines and the ways that they get seceded are the conditions for Oedipus to emerge. And in that sense, Oedipus as a representation um, can have that functionality in relation to the socius and the body of our organs. This is what you might call the repressing representation. Precisely. Um, sorry. So with that, when you're talking about like what I should do in that, that sounds like the super egoization of the big other to me. Um, so at that level... I mean, it kind of depends where we, which one we're working with. But if we're, we're talking about like the shoulds here and the normative, that is only possible through the unconscious production, right? So the territorialities, the signs, the codifications of desire, this these being produced um, unconsciously, right? These territorialities, these zones of intensities um, and the codifications, as I understand it, that is all being produced unconsciously and something like Oedipus can affect how that is all going to be produced. Yes. Now, in terms of the signs and like what things mean, I mean like, okay, so if you're talking about like something like man, right, what is man? So the first thing would be right to talk about how it functions. Yeah. 
So when we talk about, and actually when they talk about race, this might even be the best, one of the best examples they give. Um, when we're dealing with something like a race, right? A race is not inherent, race is created in this sense, it's produced. Um, it exists through codes, through intensities, and through um, positionalities and territories. So in that sense, something like, um, in your example, uh, man, or uh, like the example they give, right, the superior race, that is enabled in the territory, as is um, something like beast or negro in the Rimbaud quote. So these two, th there's a relationship here that's enabled through the territory in the first place. We find ourselves, as I understand them, we're this production of that um, that territoriality and that codification of desire. That all is productive, right? The the desires have been coded in that sense through the recoding process, and the territory is territorialized in that sense. Where these get inscribed in that, well, that, that is the inscription. The intensities of something like that race that should be distributed already through the um, through the celibate machine upon whatever is in the assemblage. Right? The, the desire machines have already been um, already connecting in this sense, and the paranoic and the schizophrenic processes, the body without organs, is already putting this to work to enable those um, those intensities to be distributed so that we can have subjectivities, right? So at some level, um, male or whiteness and that, it has these intensities, it has these codifications, and it's being, these subjectivities are sort of dispersed upon the, uh, the desiring machines, right? I think we're probably at the same level right here, right now. Yes. Um, I, so... Uh, let me take one sidestep, though, because I think we're starting to diverge. So to me, the, the signifier is created in Oedipus, and, and race would be another. There's a, uh, a wonderful part about the study of like blackness and whiteness and what it means to people and what it means you are not, which is primarily actually what it is. It's a repressive system, the sort of nature of how we talk about, I mean, really anything. It's a, I don't want to get too much into difference and repetition here, but that's a little bit of a callback to a few other Deleuze works. Um, so that let's take race, the 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 nature of sort of the the anger and hatred that goes with it, as anyone who's written anything on like anti-Semitism would testify, is that uh, there's an odd repression that takes place by the nature of it, because you tend to talk about these races you dislike in terms that are, uh, I don't know how to put it, but uh, base or uh, even even sometimes desirable and, and oddly. Um, very often the racist tropes, for example, among uh, the racists of the last hundred years are that blacks are, you know, free will and crazy. They smoke marijuana. They like jazz music and they have sex all the time and they're animalistic. Like there's, a, there's this weird sort of side to that. So like with these things, the, the sign, the signifier that's created inside of this repression by having this thing that is, a, that is specifically uh, repressed, that is the repressing representation, whatever it may be, in this case, Oedipus, and in another case, race, this, the, the, the referent that gets generated with this is the repressed representative. It's something else that happens inside of the nature of the desiring machines. So what gets, to quote Holland, what really gets repressed by the prohibition is thus completely different from the false image of it produced by the prohibition. Desire gets displaced onto an erroneous signified belonging to the prohibitive system of representation rather than to desire itself. So essentially, yeah. Oedipal desire yeah. is produced by the repression uh, and then gets repressed by it only after the fact. The place of repression would, to me, would be the pre-conscious, would be where we start having these uh, talks about what I'm invested in, where my interests lie, and things like that. But the things that they're talking about at that point, the, the way that they're referring to it, the, the repressed representative would be, to quote, a falsified apparent image that is actually meant to trap desire. And that is where we talk about the pre-conscious investments. They are the falsified apparent images meant to trap desire, to me. That's where I see the they difference. Can, they can parallogistically, right?
the pre-conscious is not necessarily the enemy. I, I'm, I'm not saying it is. Like, it, again, the pre-conscious is how I as a subject am able to relate to the world. Again, language and all of these things and semiotics uh, did... Lacan brilliantly understood that a lot of these things inside of our unconscious operate like language in a semiotics of its own. Uh, they're taking that and they're very much running with it and kind of taking it down to the point where Lacan almost didn't go far enough. That's again, that's the continual thing that they say. So when we talk about the unconscious, we're talking about signs. We're talking about the pre-conscious, we're talking about signifiers. To me, that's how I see the difference. Oh, yeah, that's tough. Um, I mean, it really, this is where you have to go into, like, the, the, the semiotics. We've got to talk about De Saussure, Bakhtin, and um, Hejmelt to, to get into that. Yes, this is true. Yes, this is true. I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to discuss there, but to try and cut that down, I mean, yeah, so signifying chains and the way they, that works with desiring production, right? The codification of desire and that. Yeah, we're talking about um, signifiers, right? And, and, and in an asignifying sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, something like race is produced in that manner, right? It's, it's produced through the codification of desire. And I do mean the recoding process when I say that just like it's produced in relation to the re-territorializing process. So something like the, you know, a, a Caucasian ethnicity or the, um, uh, an African-American ethnicity and that, it's just having been produced in that certain manner through point signs and through intensities, right? Just to be very simple about it. And that, that in terms of something like an index of love, that collection of investments, I mean, that's, changing process um as it as production occurs right and as reproduction occurs all right so i'm going to quote holland here um, not only is the nuclear family as social institution the basis for oedipalized subjects and oedipal representations of desire Historically speaking, it is only the latest in a long line of social institutions responsible for the construction of fixed subjectivities and is in some ways the weakest and most abstract. Fixed subjects of all kinds arise from an illegitimate use of the conjunctive syntheses that segregates one set of subjectivities from all the others and demands that an otherwise nomadic subjectivity, which is the legitimate conjunctive synthesis, identify only with members of a restricted set whites rather than blacks, men rather than women, Christians, not Jews, and so forth. Instead of the I am everyone and anyone of the nomadic subject, the segregated subject believes that he or she belongs to a superior race, as you were talking about, uh, identifies himself herself as essentially different from and better than others from which he or she is segregated. Historically, the content or rationale for such segregation is varied considerably, but the form of the illegitimate synthesis remains the same on the basis of a segregation aligning the subject with the superior us versus an inferior them, a fixed sense of identity arises that rejects as undesirable the multiform possibilities of nomadic subjectivity. Yeah, that, that sounds correct to me. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to, what I've, I hope I've um, correctly elaborated is that process. Because um, what he's saying is absolutely correct. You don't yes. have a fixed race or fixed gender for Deleuze and Guattari you're constantly produced um, out of an assemblage, right, that has subjectivities and relations to codes in that, in these territorialities. So to be nomadic, right, you're never just white, you're produced as white, and you can be produced as, I mean, they give the example of Schreber, right? He goes from Aryan to Mongol, right? So when we talk about things like, um, even like white supremacy or like the patriarchy, it's to understand that that's not a fits notion in the first place, that this is being reproduced through the unconscious in a certain sense, or can be. And it can also have it be in regards to a displacement, right, at the pre-conscious level. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's right. There's not a biological determinism for them. Well, and he goes on to say that um, it is not just that Oedipal familial relations are subordinate to social relations, but that they might have been fabricated to meet the requirements of the social formation itself. 
Uh, what is important for yeah. present purposes no, that, is that that's in, right because uh, even with like Christianity and that it's always contextualized right it's always relative to a territory so something like a majoritarianism is contextualized it's not a universal it's contingent so um So, so it's it's ultimately for them. Uh, let me try to say it another way. Anything that is socially determinate, uh, again, prescriptive use of signifiers, Oedipal, race, uh, whatever it may be, is uh, the illegitimate use of the uh, synthesis, just sort of by nature. And the issue they're saying is throughout all of this uh, that. Uh, to quote, the tiresome, mechanically repetitive quality of psychoanalytic studies of culture and society, everything amounts to Oedipus for Freud, to lack for Lacan, or surplus enjoyment for Zizek. Uh, and for them, they're flipping it backwards and saying, start again, start from the design machines. For me, again, I, we need to have a discussion around where preconscious sits. But um, to me, where we start seeing that interaction, when we have the conversation around where literally the repression takes place from a mathematical processual standpoint, however you want to phrase it. Uh, the society believes in a thing. How do I make myself American? I need to be American because this is what I've been told. And because of that, how does that ultimately cause my disjunction okay. to get fucked up? Okay. I'm starting to see where you're coming from more because at that level you are talking. I mean, that's, that is the super egoization they talk about. That's like the group fantasy chapter. So yeah, I, I see where you're coming from there. But with the unconscious, to me, the, the key part for them there is that something that is American, whatever the hell that means these days, hang on. And uh, by the way, anyone else in the room, you're free to jump in at any time. Right now you're just listening to Jack and I go back and forth and I'm, I don't know how exciting it is for anyone, but Jack and I, I mean, it's great for me. I love this. I could do this shit literally all day, but I'm sure it's just not the most exciting thing. Feel free to jump in uh, after Jack gets a chance to respond. I think someone's knocking on his door to yell at him that he's got to go to, uh, I'm betting, dinner. I'm betting he's got to go cook dinner. That's my guess. Hello? There you are. Go ahead and continue. Hey. I filled, in, I filled in the blank. You're good. Okay, yeah. Um, I've been taken behind the back again. Now, um, okay, but the important thing to keep in mind there is that, like, your so race and all this um, gender is contingent for them. So even something like being an American, right? The codification, you don't start with being an American. Whatever you're going to be in reference to, whatever the super ego or the big other in that, because for them, the big other is a signifier in the first place. These are in relation to something that's already been produced, right? So you're not you're not Jack Kerouac trying to figure out what it means to be an American. Um, very much in your example, you can see there's already something there um, that you're finding yourself in relation to. Now, if we go back to race or something like that, the codifications, the intensities that enable race, right? It's not simply that the color of your skin or I really do prefer the term ethnicity myself, but because um, I think race can be, well, even ethnicity, if you look at uh, even what you get at the, uh, the doctor's office, right? There's like six different ethnicities to begin with. But anyways, um, what makes those possible at the unconscious level to produce that is a series of codes and intensities, right? The zones and, and that on the body of that organs, the point signs and the machines connecting, right? Well, so I, I'm gonna just real quick, I'm gonna stop because I think the answer is yes. I wanna just give an edge to it because I think this is where, uh, for me, when we have the point where we talk about say social groups, it is a bi vocalization because it takes everything on the BWO and it's either that those signs, those partial objects are part of the sign, part of the signifier or not. That's it, everything is yes or no. Uh, it's not directly saying that it's relation one between two, but it's saying, uh, you know, black people have X, Y, or Z, any of those things. The, the binding vocalization and intensities and all that, that happens on the BWO. 
this bionovocalization happens there. This is everything gets organized and set in relation to the signifiers in that point. Well, yeah, I mean, if you've got an either or distinction, right, if you're, you know, male or female or whatever, yeah, you've got a problem there. I mean, they get into this with like, you know, we're at the, in the first synthesis, one has the, uh, a certain bisexuality or sort of dual sexuality in the sense that they have um, a series of machines, right? So like men have nipples, which are uh, considered a feminine thing, but they also have like the penis. In the same sense, a woman has a clitoris, which is a kind of penis, right? The potentialities are already there in a way that like the exclusive disjunction of male, female can't really address, which is to pass into the second synthesis and thereby say that one is not always heterosexual any more than one is always bisexual. You're, when you find yourself in a contest, right, having been produced a certain way, that's when something like saying I'm bisexual in this moment is possible because it's already having been produced and that exists in relation to those intensities and those codes. Right. I would, I would also add, though, that one of the things that sort of happens here is as, uh, as those things become a thing, uh, we could almost deal with them if they were all directly related to partial objects, uh, which in theory, and uh, apologies to all trans people, I don't believe any of this shit. Uh, oh, a man is a man. I have a penis. A woman's a woman. Here's the characteristics. Cut that. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 tra here is what uh, what man is, and here's what a woman is scientifically, which is a lot of things people love to say. Like we almost could deal with that, and if that was the case, that'd be kind of nice because then we would know things. The problem is the first time this happens, and over time, these uh, identifications that we have become increasingly more abstracted. This is the because again. Uh, Everything's dealing with partial objects. These sign, these signifiers are not, you know, hardened, concretized. Here's what they are, from a like logical, positivist, provable standpoint. These are ideas. These are concepts. And so, because of that, as they get more and more abstracted, uh, at that point, basically, people begin to quote uh, fall into the second paralogism, which Deleuze and Guattari call the paralogism of application, by applying the, in this case, Oedipal triangular grid to everything, or the us versus them, black versus white, rich versus poor, by insisting on biunivocalized interpretations that constantly reduce all the rich complexity of real social determinations to narrow abstract figures. So this is what it all means. It was your father, it was your mother, mm -hmm. is the sort of resultant of that. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I'm not sure we disagree there because like the we, we don't i don't think i actually yeah. don't think we disagree at all i think it's a matter of us trying to figure out the language around this because it's this is not something well, that is stated as far as i can tell in anything i like while i was reading pre-conscious is not something they ever spend a lot of time talking about in any of the books that i have written by deleuze or guattari at all well, and i have all of them in pdf i did a control f it sucks there's nothing that's probably and this is actually why i don't really agree with calling desire noetic it's probably because this is the as far as i can tell this book is very much about how to create out of psychoanalysis through a re-engagement with it from what i gather listening to you guys talking about the other books i mean they're still engaging with psychoanalysis and the unconscious but this form of like these investments in that because i've read some of quadri's other work uh, he still talks about the socius and desiring machines, but he doesn't really get into the the pre-conscious and the unconscious as much. In fact, he, um, from what I can tell, even in a thousand plateaus, they're going to build. Um, it's not like it goes away, but they're they're the work changes as they go, and the context changes. So, like even the body without organs, as I read Antiedipus, I don't think you can become a body without organs. But in a thousand plateaus, my understanding is you can be, right? How to be a body of that organs, I think, is actually a chapter. So the concepts are going to shift. Um, but at least in the terms of our discussion now, yeah, that does seem to be the question for you and me is how are we understanding the unconscious, the pre-conscious? Because a lot seems to ride on that, um, especially where I was uh, criticizing Zizek or even Wolf. I mean, my criticism of him is, he will say you've got to change the system, 
my thing is I understand losing. Why are they saying, no, you've got to change the production of the system, how the system produces and its production, not simply the system itself. Correct. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's where I think he's got a blind spot. All right. With that, unless someone has a question, I'm going to end this because this went way longer than it was supposed to. So, but hey, we're open. Any questions, comments before I uh, stop us off? Anything going on? How y'all doing? Excellent. Real quick, Ken, can you give us a quick definition of the preconscious? What was that? You asked for a definition of the unconscious? The, the pre-conscious. Oh, the pre-conscious, man. Um, I'll have to come back to you on that. Hey, Freud, uh, gives uh, Freud gives it. Freud gives it. I have it up, actually, Ken. I have it up real quick. Um, nice. Uh, there's two kinds of unconscious. The pre-conscious restricts access to consciousness and is responsible for voluntary movement and attention. Um, uh, two kinds of unconscious, one which easily, under frequently occurring circumstances, transformed into something conscious, and another with which this transformation is difficult and takes place only subject to a considerable expenditure of effort or possibly not at all. We call the unconscious, which is only latent and thus easily becomes conscious, the pre-conscious and retain the term unconscious for the other. It's a direct quote from Freud from Interpretation of Dreams. Okay, as I'm thinking about it, dealing with the pre-conscious is dealing, dealing with what's not desired in machines, but already been has already been produced in that manner, as opposed to Correct. the unconscious, where we're directly dealing with that production, right? And this this is a really Marxian way of talking about it, actually. But it, it's no, no, it's it's, it's it's totally that. If we think about the factory and we think about the delivery and me as the customer, if the subject is the customer, effectively the box that holds the thing is essentially the pre-conscious on its way to me and the unconscious is the factory producing all of it. Yeah. The entirety of you, the bots and everything in between, right? Because they, they're very clear, right? The production of production is the production of production, distribution and consumption. And that's all part of the unconscious for them. Yeah, I think so. And, and it's a matter of ultimately, since it's desiring machines all the way down, and we're talking about orders of magnitude. It's the same way that we may discuss uh, how atoms work versus uh, material, which can be as collections of atoms versus planets. It's orders of magnitudes of ultimately discussing the same thing that at its basic level is just desiring machines. But it's about how they interact and how the uh, scale of them changes perception as well as existence. We're just changing perspectives to talk about what's going on. All right. All right, with that, I am going to bounce. Uh, thank all of you guys for joining us. This was a hell of a discussion. Tomorrow we're going to be continuing. I think we're at 1-6 of Anti-Oedipus. It's going to be our ongoing reading. I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I hope to see all of you.